go. Maybe recall the order. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The March State Board work session will now come to order. Denise, please call roll. Lisa Fricky. Here. Patsy Cojones. Here. Deborah Neary. Here. Robin Stevens. Here. Rachel Wise. Here. John Witzel. Here. Patricia Tim. Yes. Maureen Nichols. Yes. Commissioner Bloomstedt. Here. Thank you, Denise. All Information present. regarding the Open Meetings Act is posted on the east wall of this room on the south side of the door. Live web streaming will be available through the State Board of Education website. Board members, please engage your microphones before speaking and turn them off when you're done speaking. And please turn off your cell phones now. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the commissioner's report and consent agenda process. Yeah, so first, just as part of routine, you have the pink form. If there's anything on the consent agenda that you would like removed for a separate vote, uh, or if you need additional information, please let us know. But fill out that pink form and put it in front of Scott there, and that will uh, take care of that side of the equation. Um, the report on rules, um, you have that attached in here. There's, there's two, two rules still pending. Uh, approval by the Attorney General's Office, Rules 91 and 92, and I just got a little bit of an update. I believe they're kind of in, in the process being looked at. Um, so Leslie Donnelly actually is the one that looks at those. So, so um, that's in the process, um, and we'll see what, what that feedback is, um, well, hopefully pretty soon. So um, other than that, I, Ryan, did you have anything you weren't going to come up for? So. Um, so we just got really efficient all of a sudden. So um, <laughs> um, uh, there's a few items, actually some presentations coming up. I'll just kind of highlight, um, I think, four of them um, and kind of put it in context for you a little bit. Um, first of all, we're going to have Don come up and, and present on uh, Rule 10 history. Um, this is part of our trying to inform the full board about about the, uh, some of the background information around Rule 10 and that, that particular direction. We'll have some conversations. Shane's going to come up in a little while on uh, special ed funding and maintenance of effort, give you a little more background follow-up from our last meeting. Um, Dean's going to be here to talk a little bit about data collection process, and uh, Jeremy's here to talk about the assessment data timeline or assessment timeline, I'll call it maybe better. So, But I'll, I'll uh, bring Don on up for his... Uh, I'm just going to say great presentation. I, you know, I, I don't want to oversell yeah, early, please, but, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen Don uh, give this, uh, this historical perspective before, and I think it'll be really good information as we start working on Rule 10 for, for the full board to hear. So, Don, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bloomstead. So, good afternoon. My name is Don Lowski, and I am the Accreditation Section, section Director uh, in the Office of Accountability, Accreditation, and Program Approval. And I'm here today to speak to you about Rule 10 and the rule that provides regulations and procedures for the accreditation of schools and then also talk about the history behind accreditation in Nebraska and Nebraska schools. This research came about as part of our Rule 10 revision that is currently that we have opened right now. And so I, I always like to go back and look at the historical pieces to see where were we in the past, how did we get from there to hear, and so I found it very interesting going through all of the information that was left in the accreditation office and put together a document that I, that's been handed out to you, which is a chronological order of, of rules, regulations, of uh, laws, uh, manuals, of, uh, everything you can think of. So I'm going to kind of start in the middle of this document and kind of walk you through where we, how we got for our, from our current Rule 10 to where we are now, and then talk a little bit about historical before that and where, where we've been since uh, 2015, which is the, the last uh, time that Rule 10 was opened and uh, authorized was August 1st of 2015. So back 30 years ago in 1989, the uh, State Board had repealed Rule 14 and 15 and created what is now called Rule 10, and this is what it looks like, okay? The difference between the Rule 10 that we have currently and the Rule 10 that was uh, happening in 1989 is that it both accredited, did accreditation and approval of public schools and non-public schools, which ours does now too, but 
public schools had the option to be just approved. They could be approved or they could seek accreditation. So that's probably the biggest difference with the uh, 1989 where we were. Then between 1989 and 2015, we've had 18 revisions where we've opened up Rule 10, made changes to it, and, uh, and then now we're to the 2015. And so we are in the process of the 19th revision of our current Rule 10. So in that time frame also, uh, non-public schools had Rule 14 became the, the rule that guided uh, approval for Rule 14 schools. So there was a time frame, one of the revisions in one of those uh, 18 revisions was to remove non-publics from Rule 10, give them their own rule as approved and stating that all public schools would now be accredited. With, rural school, with um, non-public schools, if they want to be accredited, they certainly can apply for a Rule 10 accreditation, but they have to be approved as a non-public school. So we, there was a split in there from the very beginning of Rule 10, where it started out being a, an accredited and approval process, and then it's now divided out. So what we currently have Rule 10, is accredits are public schools and non-public schools that wish to be accredited. Rule 14 is for approval. So there's kind of two different terms there that uh, you will see as I talk about some of the history too that come into play also. So I've gone over 30 years really quickly. Now I'm going to go back 150 years. <laughs> uh, back to uh, Nebraska had been a state for two years. So in uh, in 1869, uh, Nebraska became a state in 1867, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction was created. And there was a joint uh, accreditation between the University of Nebraska and the Department of Public Education. It was the University of Nebraska that was accrediting high schools uh, with, in, in uh, conjunction with the uh, Department of Public, uh, Public Instruction at that time. And so it was uh, driven by the, the University of Nebraska. And it remained that way until 1940 when the university chose to remove themselves from the accreditation process and it was all taken over by the Nebraska Department of Education. So from 1869 until 1940 it was a joint process between the university and, and the Department of Ed. It got to the point at one time where the university was accrediting schools that wanted to be accredited and the, and the Department of Ed was accrediting schools that wanted to be approved. And then it moved to where the department was doing it all from 1940. So I, I was calling that the early years and that's uh, because that's kind of letting you know where we kind of started back in 1869, 150 years ago. And most of accreditation, I shouldn't say most, all was with high schools. There was not with elementary at that time. Um, also in 1896, Nebraska became a member of NCA, which is now Advanced Ed. And so NCA was providing accreditation for high schools uh, along with working with the Department of Ed. Then I the development years were 1949 to 1974, where in 1949, the, there was an establishment of accrediting elementary and secondary schools, both public and private. In ninth, also the commissioner authorized to appoint an accreditation committee. So we have a state accreditation committee that has been functional since 1949, uh, which was uh, quite a long time ago. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and the commissioner, that is his committee to bounce ideas off, get feedback, support, and so forth. So that's been since 1949. Then in um, 1952, the, there was a constitutional amendment, so there was a vote. Uh, to establish the State Department of Education and the Commissioner of Education and the creation of a State Board of Education. So 1952 is when your function became uh, alive, active by uh, act of the voters. It was a, a vote to have this created, have it as a constitutional amendment. 
then from 1975 to the present, I call it our regulations and procedures. So from 1975, Rule 14, regula regulations, procedures for approval of continued legal operation of all schools and opening of new schools <coughs> happened, so, and that's the Rule 14 that we are using now for non-public schools. In 79, Rule 11 was regulations and procedures for the accreditation of public and non-public schools. In 1983, there was Rule 15, and, and then in 1989, they, they repealed 14 and 15 and merged into 10. That's the year that Rule 10 became born and uh, became the document that is guiding education in here. Um, I wanted to give you just a few, I, I'm watching my time too. Um, there's just some different things that have happened over the time that I kind of want to highlight as part of this when you go through this document here is that there's been, over the years, different levels of accreditation that have been tried. Currently, we do not have any level system in our accreditation. Either you're accredited or you're not accredited. And so in, 1980, in, in 1884, schools were major accredited or minor accredited. In 1918, they were accredited A, B, C, and junior accredited. In 1926, they were an approved high school, a minor accredited, accredited, or NCA accredited high school. And then in 1951, they were an A, double A, or a triple A. And then in 52, they removed the triple A and they you were either an A or a double A. So there has been lots of different examples of trying to do credit uh, accreditation on a, on a tiered level. Um, I cannot tell you why that changed or what was the rationale behind that, but I'm just saying that that has been a, a conversation, a common theme through all of this. Another one that I think you might find interesting is that in, in 1999, rules one, two, three, and four were uh, adopted and those were our content standards. Rule one was our uh, English, language arts, we had math, science, and social studies and they were separate rules. Then in 2002, rules one, two, three, and four were repealed and the standards were included in rule 10. Um, so that was one of the revisions was to move the standards and that's where they are currently is they are housed in rule 10. That's why this book is so thick because it's got all of the standards in it. Then in 2000, teacher evaluation, which was rule 34, and multicultural education, which was rule 16, were rolled into rule 10. So you can see rule 10 seems to be the rule that continues to grow as we, as, as different issues come up and uh, different thinking and so forth. And so we've had teacher evaluation, which was a separate rule, and multicultural, which was a separate rule, and they put them all into rule 10, and that's where they currently are. So one fun fact that I think uh, that I found in this was that in 1986, Joe Luchaharm, the commissioner, gave a report to the State Board of Education, which he gave a report on schools not complying with manda mandatory requirements of Rule 14, that would be our non-publics. We still have a few schools that maybe we have some of those issues with. Schools that continue to employ non-certificated teachers, we certainly still are dealing with that for public, for public non-public, uh, accredited and approved. This one, schools that have failed to comply with the regulation that by July 1, 1986, each elementary school shall have a lavatory, drinking fountain, restroom, and toilet located inside the school building. They may use a travel trailer or motorhome's water system and a toilet. And so I think we've come a ways from 1986 as far as what we are addressing with uh, uh, public education in, uh, in Nebraska. That's what I have, Dr. Boop said. Well, and I, to a really a big compliment, he, he's going through this really quickly. He did a, a, Don did a great exercise with the advisory committee um, where folks kind of would dive into this a little bit deeper and have some conversations. But there are some themes that I think we've even talked about, like levels of accreditation and, and the types of things, whether standards fit in Rule 10 or not. Uh -huh. But I, I, you know, it's what I told Don when he started showing me. I said, so all my good ideas have been thought of before. That's <laughs> what, I, um, what we came across. But um, the, I think that historical context is really also important. So, I mean, I'd, I'd open it up, certainly, if, Don, sure. if you're willing to share any other thoughts about the um, uh, kind of other things maybe we heard from that, from that meeting. I think it was in January with, uh, with the accreditation committee. 
um, at the state uh, committee meeting we were talking about we did have some activities with them actually looking into this and uh, asking for their highlights and, and that type of stuff but then we moved into the actual rule revision and uh, we wanted them to have that same information before we started having the conversation about where do we go from now what what is the rule 10 going to look like in the future uh, we know what it looked like in the past but what's it going to look like in the future and so we started bringing up some of the suggestions or ideas we call them the big ideas from your retreat that you had and started bringing those up and uh, with some uh, agreement with some but some pushback on some other ones but what it's what it made me understand is that it's hard to give an opinion that may be positive without really knowing what you're talking about when we talk about a lever, leveled layer of accreditation well that kind of scares them because they don't know what that what does that mean and we're not sure what that means and so it was good feedback from them but it, it helped me to understand we need to really be kind of putting out there what are we thinking same thing with the standards do you know is it best to have them in there or is it best to have them and if we don't have them in there what do we have them in is there can they just be standards by themselves or do they have to be put back into another rule uh, and so it probably raised more questions than than anything but i think it also gave us good insight to maybe some of the pushback or reflections that we will or support that we may have as we move forward on this that had a question When we talk about non-public schools, mm -hmm. where, do the, where do home schools fit in? Well, that's a Rule 13. That's, that's a Rule 13. Yeah, that's a separate. And, and, and they're, that's exam. totally separate. Yep. Okay, because yes. I was thinking about non-certified teachers. And, right. Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you, Don, for this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. it, uh, is. it really is very fascinating. And just kind of cruising through it, I know there was a couple things I saw where it talked about basically schools would be accredited unless they had like a violation or you know and it'd be interesting to think about well what did that really mean and what you know how did that that happen you know and what was considered a violation that triggered you're not going to be accredited so one of the challenges I have is that it's it's you know you're kind of either accredited or you're not but actually we have everybody accredited you know so it's kind of like what how do we differentiate in some capacity and it looks like we've been struggling with this since 1869 so this is not a new struggle is right. one of my takeaways from from this analysis yes. uh and and i'm a big believer if if somebody else has some good ideas let's take a look at it um I, have we looked at some other states and we have, have any summary Kansas, that could be shared Iowa, with what what are what are some things other states are doing that are very different? And what does that look like? Uh, is there some novel things happening in other states? Not necessarily to say this is where we need to go, but food for thought. What are some things in particularly in two buckets? Well, maybe three buckets. Approval, <laughs> accreditation, and then the accountability buckle, bucket. You know, what are some things? I think we've moved into a process where approval and accreditation are almost so merged that we we are putting a lot of things in rule 10 that are maybe more approval checklist kinds of things and so i just feel like it'd be interesting to know what are some models out there with those three elements the approval the accountability and the accreditation that look different sure. or that look promising or that are novel mm -hmm. just for discussion it'd be good to have that information okay lisa it. Um, I was fascinated that the that group that you met with I can't remember what you called it the commission the committee the, the committee, committee. committee yes yeah. and I don't know if this is um, appropriate or not but as a board member I would like to see some of their key questions or comments is that possible in a fact sheet I mean that would because the minute you talked about level of accreditation I was thinking one and two and there was an explanation for that and some things that would go with that um, in the discussion so I'd like to hear feedback because I look at those people as stakeholders yes and I, that helps us with decision making is 
that going to be okay? Yeah, in fact, I, I think a big <coughs> part of this, I and mean, we're going to do in this general discussion, but we'll be bringing some of that information to the strategic planning and, uh oh, no, I just lost that performance. Committee. Yeah, yeah I think I'll, I'll spy. I had spy improvement, <laughs> improvement committee <laughs> um, to that committee actually as they as they do that work because there is we are using that group to gather additional information and kind of set some context as we dive into Rule Ten and that that's been really helpful. And we'll be meeting again in May. Yeah. I this I mean this is a copy, but this is how thick the 1989 Rule Ten was, and this is. The current one that's what I have <laughs> <laughs> yes so you're you're right when you ask what were what regulations what what did schools have to do to be accredited it's not as in depth as current one one quick question um, Don can you and if you can't answer this that's fine but I was just curious why I think you said in the late 1990s were the standards put into rule I, I do not no, do you know? I, well, I mean, I, my sense of it at that time, so the state had not adopted, adopted standards in the same way where they were mandatory standards. Rachel probably has some good, uh, Rachel oh, yeah. has history. Lots of people have history yeah. probably. <laughs> but at that point, as it was starting to move, move forward, I, to enforce things, Rule 10 is the strongest enforcement that, that we tend to have because schools have to be accredited after whatever year that was, after 89, I think. Right. Um, public schools have to be accredited, so it was the most forceful rule that that we have at at the state board level for the department level, and I think that's why they got layered into that. But I'm sure there's a lot of other details. So, hmm. I'd like to close with one uh, short paragraph from an article that was written back in uh, 1983 um, by. Let me see. Uh, <laughs> that was written by Merlin. May Minoff. He was the director of approval and accreditation, and Sharon Meyer. And I'm sure everybody remembers Sharon, but they did an article for a magazine called The Structure of Education in Nebraska. But their last paragraph, when in 1983, is just as appropriate as it is now in this year. Nebraska's educational structure, like any complex human organization, requires continuous study and occasional change to fit new and emerging needs of our society. However, Nebraskans should take pride in an educational structure that has provided consistently high quality educational opportunities for the youth of our state. So even back then, I mean, I think that kind of, those two things have been what have led all of our work with Rule 10 is it, it centers around what's best for kids, but then it also needs to be open enough to take in changes in society and changes in education. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. <coughs> President. I, I, this should be a, a good opportunity for me to put to bed the rumor that Don used me as an eyewitness account to 1869. <laughs> <laughs> Robin. <laughs> so noted. <laughs> so thank you, Don, very much. Um, so I'll go ahead and have uh, Shane come up for item 2.5, a um, little discussion and presentation on but it looks, looks like he has co-conspirators too. So. <laughs> Good afternoon, Shane Ryan, Budget and Operations Officer, and I've got Greg Prohasco with me from uh, Special Education Finance. If Don's presentation was great, mine will be brief. <laughs> um, <clears throat> last month there was a question during uh, Amy and Greg's presentation about some information on special education funding. So worked with Greg to put some information together for you on funding for special education in Nebraska public schools. There are two main types of special education programs in our public schools. There are programs for those children who are below age five, and those are funded predominantly out of local property tax funds and federal grant funds from the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. There are, are, there's also a school age program, which is funded out of those same two buckets, but then the state has about a quarter of a billion dollars that is appropriated for special education funding as well. 
The rules and regulations around special education funding are the Individuals with Disability Education Act and then the Uniform Grants Guidance. Within those, there is a maintenance of effort requirement for not only school districts, but also for the state. This is something that's common among grant, federal grant funds across all different federal agencies, but is uh, predominantly in IDEA in our education setting in the K-12 uh, area. <clears throat> Maintenance of effort is measured at the state level with a combination of how much the state appropriates and spends for special education and then, a com then the combination of all local effort at the school district level. School districts are then measured at their level as well and if they don't spend as much funds in the current year as they did in the previous year, there are some tests to see why that maintenance of effort was met and some possible exceptions. Uh, those basically revolve around uh, the number of special education students or exceptions for the level of service those students require. So if you had a student that had considerable amount of expenditures related to them leave your school district, it would be expected that you would spend less the following year. And with, with that being documented, then that's an ex, uh, acceptable exception for not maintaining your level of effort. Um, this is reviewed annually uh, by the special education staff and the past year we had about 10% of our school districts who did not meet maintenance of effort and so uh, as a result of that we're withholding that uh, maintenance of effort penalty from their uh, state reimbursement on their school age program and we'll remit that back to the U.S. Department of Education as part of that maintenance of effort process. Um, as far as state rules go, we have multiple rules around special education, but the primary rule revolving around uh, <coughs> reimbursement for our school age programs is Rule 51. Uh, I focus on, rule f on school age programs with the state reimbursement because currently we do not reimburse for any early childhood education with special education funds in the below age five area. So a school districts only receive money from the Department of Education for K through 12 special education programs. Whenever we give presentations to SPED directors or superintendents around special education funding, we always point out to them that the best way to maximize the available resources for them is to use as much of their federal IDEA funds for their below age five programs as possible and not spend those federal grant funds on the school age program because those expenditures that are reimbursed with federal funds are excluded from the uh, state program. So some context. 1718 is the most recent school year we have a complete picture of special education funding. It was 534 million dollars across all age groups. Uh, about 13% of that was federal funds out of IDEA, 67.5 million. 42% of that was state funds, 226.4 million. And 45% was local property tax funds, 240 million. So school districts are paying the largest share of the special education programs out there right now today. If we look at some historical trends, Back in 2013-14, we had a total special education expenditures of $427 million. Um, $67 million was out of federal funds, $212 million was out of state funds, and $148 million was out of local funds. Fast forward to the 17-18 year, we had the total of almost $534 million. $67 million in federal funds. We're up to $226 million for state funds, but the local district funds have increased almost $100 million. Their share is now up to $240 million. There is LB 346 that's currently in the legislature right now that would uh, add additional funding for the school age programs and guarantee a certain level of reimbursement relative to their expenditures. Uh, LB 346 would fix the reimbursement rate for the 1819 and 1920 school year at 60 percent, the next two years at 70 percent, and then from 22-23 and beyond at 80 percent. 
some historical perspective, as the special education costs have gone up extensively and relatively small increases in the state appropriations, we've seen what we are able to reimburse drop from 57 percent down to a projected 49 percent for this most recent school year. Uh, the way the reimbursement program works is the legislature appropriates a certain amount of money. We collect the special education expenditures in the final financial reports and review those for allowable expenditures and then pay them out on a proportional basis. Uh, so everyone shares equitably in the amount of reimbursement based on their costs. But as you can see from the historical trend, uh, local school districts are having to uh, dedicate an ever increasing portion of their budgets to special education. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes. Thank you so much for this information. It's mm -hmm. really, really valuable. And you might have uh, shared it and I missed it. So I just mm -hmm. want to go back to uh, the birth to five. Yes. What percentage of federal funds is birth to five? So birth to five is, uh, I don't have that exact percentage, okay. but it is almost half of the uh, special education programs. So school districts, if they're doing a good job, will utilize as much of their federal funds as they can for those below age five programs. Uh, IDEA dollars can be used, uh, most of the IDEA dollars can be used for any age group. There is a portion that is reserved for uh, preschool education, right. three and four year olds, but the enrollment poverty and the base IDEA funds can be used for any age group from birth to age 21. So, so they if, have a lot of flexibility there. Yeah, if we have any information of, you know, like an um, average across the state, it'd sure. be interesting to know on the birth to five the percentage local districts are spending versus the IDEA since the state is not supporting. Because Nebraska has been a leader in being birth to five yes. versus three to 21, which I think is great. And I think that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yet I think it's important that we make sure people understand, though it's the right thing to do, the state is not investing right. yes. in birth yeah. to five. It, I think I've got that correct. Yes. That the state has not made a commitment or investment in birth to five in special education. And I think that is a really important yes. data point that we need to share and that we need to make sure people understand mm -hmm. because birth to five is so critical in that early intervention. Yeah. Uh, yet it's only a local and federal investment <coughs> in birth to five. And so if we care about early childhood in the state, which we often talk about early childhood, we need to create a voice of support for early childhood and special education for state funding to support uh, at least a percentage of birth to five from state funding for those children that are identified with needs from birth to five. I'd like to add that uh, with a statewide percentage of IDA funds going to birth, birth to age five, um, whatever that percentage is, <clears throat> it wouldn't apply to every district because uh, IDA funds are allocated to districts based on uh, their total school membership right. and uh, some other factors also in poverty. So there's a lot of, a lot of smaller districts that get more IDA funds than that than their whole below age five special ed program costs. Mm -hmm. So then again, like Shane says, it encourage it to use IDA funds first for that, and then mm -hmm. they could use the additional for school aids costs. Um, but then on the other end of the spectrum, there's larger schools that their below age five programs are way larger than the amount of IDA funds they get so right, right. And, and I think that's a really good point and I think that's why if we can have that information um, in a way that advocates I think all the information shared is really valuable but that birth to five piece mm -hmm. is a really important piece because if I'm sitting there in a school district and whether I use IDEA school age or birth to five either way I'm gonna have a limitation in what comes to me from the state uh, for my school age uh, because they're not going to be I mean it's a decreasing percentage from school age and I think that picture we should make sure we paint and advocate for is that it's a decreasing investment at the state level for school age and there's a zero investment 
at the state level for birth to five. And that, I think, people can understand. Uh, I don't know that a lot of times people understand the, the challenges that local school districts are facing mm -hmm. around providing high quality special education, education services birth to 21. And that challenge is that the state has not uh, met its, um, in my view, obligation for school age and it has made no investment birth to five. And that's, I think, an important conversation that we as board members should help carry forward. Lisa? Um, the maintenance of effort, I think I've got that mm -hmm. down. And I just want to make sure that's the state determination, maintenance of effort. So the federal IDEA law requires that both the state and local school districts spend as much in the current year as they did in the previous year. Right. Um, so that is generally very easy for the state to meet because that looks at both the, the state appropriation, which has gone up one to two percent annually, and uh, the costs of the local school districts have gone up considerably. Mm -hmm. There are some school districts who wind up not meeting that maintenance of effort level um, when you look at what they spent with their local funds and what they received from the state as well and after we review that annually and make a determination whether or not they fit the exception of having fewer students or having students with fewer needs um, if they don't meet either of those exception criteria then yes there is a penalty that is leveled based on federal regulations that we collect out of their school age reimbursement of state funds and my concern I guess mm -hmm. and uh, the question that I really wanted to know is I could see in a school, in my mind as a teacher, where students make great leaps in their mm -hmm. educational um, education and they're doing better and maybe are going more into the classroom and not needing special <laughs> services anymore. And so when you're talking about maintenance of effort, that lowers the cost and I don't want them to be penalized because they're doing a great job how do we address that or do we i don't know well, <laughs> i'll defer to greg on this yeah. one <laughs> currently that that that's such an easy question i'm gonna let them answer <laughs> I, I mean i i can see that potentially happening we have great special ed teachers regular teachers that co-teach with special ed um, teachers and kids are making leaps and bounds in certain areas at different grade levels and if that causes less money to go into the school and then they're penalized, and I, help me understand Well, your, your example, yeah, that's a tough one because the federal exceptions would not allow for that to be an exception unless it was uh, over a certain threshold of a dollar amount per a kid, mm -hmm. which would be, we use the uh, statewide average for people cost, which is like eleven, twelve thousand right. dollars. So if it exceeded that, it could be an exception. But otherwise, that isn't an allowable exception for the federal. Regs. Maybe that's not a scenario that would happen. But I, I just can imagine what? there are great so, things happening out there. So yeah, there's anyway. yeah, just year to year changes with services. Uh, pretty much isn't an exception. It's for yeah. the federal regulations. Well, thank you for tackling that one. <laughs> and I do think you bring up a good point, and that interfaces with MTSS. It also started some of this conversation. Mm -hmm. As we do those kinds of things, there is a potential risk that schools have in, in this process. And I think it's one of the challenges we have is to ensure that we have a responsibility that we are articulating to our um, lawmakers at the federal level what we want to see changed in maintenance of effort that does not penalize in particularly small rural schools. That's where I think the risk is greater because, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there are smaller numbers. There are some other factors that come into play. So I think for us that becomes a part of our responsibility to try to um, lead with recommended change at the federal level, in particularly if IDEA is coming up down the near future of, of reauthorization because it's a 
maintenance of effort IDEA issue, correct? Yes. Um, yeah. So I think the difference between your two examples is that your example, <coughs> the student is still identified as special ed, and in your example, you would probably have a student that isn't identified as, as special ed anymore, and then you would have a an exception for a uh, per capita amount of expenditures um, for maintenance of effort. So there's there would be an adjustment allowable for that situation. And just to follow up on what I've heard uh, Rachel and Lisa ask you. Uh, this isn't an unusual question uh, that comes from superintendents, but they say, I'm trying to um, keep costs down and then I get penalized for it, which is not meeting maintenance of effort. And I was going to ask you for, uh, for how I should respond to them. So if I'm not mistaken, I'm just going to say, that's a tough one. <laughs> Well, certainly, it's a tough balancing act when you're looking at the level of service and the level of cost to provide that service. And so, yeah, it, it does put an admin, a school administrator in a difficult position. It's, yeah, e efficiency uh, isn't an exception in the Fed's mind. I'm not going to say I agree with that either, but uh, it, it's... I think it's unfortunate because we expect the schools to be good stewards of the funds and stuff. Um, if what I would say is if a school district is contemplating some of those situations, especially when it's dealing with contracting with uh, different agencies and stuff to uh, contact us because there's some some situations if if the contracting agencies uh, decline to provide services and stuff, there's there's some exceptions that could happen because of that. So if I'd say, yeah, if, if you know of anybody who's and we when we tell districts that too that we can talk about those situations and see if there's a way to do that where it does fall under an exception category. And I joined because I was having a little bit of a panic attack back there but I was going to say what Greg just said please tell them to contact us I think more times than not superintendents or even business managers feel like they need to make that decision in isolation but it is our job to help them to figure those pieces out there's so many other expenditures that could be happening happening specifically in how are they providing early intervention what service providers are they using to provide early intervention so that if those students who are no longer qualifying for special education are receiving services to keep them at that level, again, it's maintaining whatever level they are needing to be at, not only fiscally, but at an education rate, who's providing that? What costs are those being covered under in a federal IDEA or state level funding component? And those are all pieces that we can help them figure out when sometimes they see it's this pot or this pot and this is how we've always done it well, let's be creative and let's think about how these things can be worked out instead of falling strictly to, oh, I'm not going to make maintenance of effort. We spend hours and hours working with districts and we want to continue to help them do that. Yeah, I would just kind of thank all, everyone for, I mean, the, the reality is, and I'm glad Amy came up to say that because we've put tools out there for them to look at on and different ways to do it but I think primarily especially for all of you if you hear those concerns certainly send send folks our way I don't except for Robin I don't expect the rest of you to be able to explain it all um, but no I mean it's really what we do so so I gotta I just gotta say one thing this is uh, Shane's last board meeting um, in front of us as you all know Shane's leaving us for for uh, past, pastures on the eastern side, I'll say <laughs> he's going to Omaha Public Schools. Still part of the education system. Yeah, and we're really, um, you know, proud of what Shane's accomplished uh, at the agency and been part of part of that important work that we've done over the. I mean, especially over the last year. I mean, the the changes that we've made and. Um, and I, I know we'll miss him, but I, I thought I better give you that chance to say say that now because this is your last shot at him. Is what I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. 
Shane, before you leave, I have one question for you for me. Yes. If the board wanted access to the slides you just presented, where could we uh, obtain those? So you have a PDF attached to the agenda in Spark, okay. but I can certainly uh, share a copy of the PowerPoint presentation with Ryan. Okay, very good. Thank you. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, mine was, okay. yeah, it was... It was okay. yes. the circle of death on that yeah. thing. So. Shane, I want to thank you for teaching me all of the finance acronyms. I'll be oh, forever grateful. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So uh, next on the agenda is um, Dean, Dr. Folkers, gets to come up and share a little bit about where, um, well, a combination of history and vision, I think, probably, right? A combination. So. <laughs> and I'll add in the brief part. <laughs> So greetings, I am um, Dean Folkers. I serve as the Information Systems Officer here at the Department of Education. And um, with me is um, um, Dr. Matt Hastings, um, who is the Senior Administrator of the Data Research and Evaluation Team. The Commissioner had indicated that I think last month or over the past couple of months, there's been some inquiries and some discussions as well as some new board members that maybe don't have the full complete context of all of the things that are happening in the world of data collection. And so what we thought we would do is um, share with you um, a little bit about where we've been, where we're going, and where we are in this space of data collection. So it is a compendium of history and future as a part of that work. So um, in the spirit of statutory authority, there's a number of these references. I should say, um, once Spark gets back up, this is available in Spark uh, as far as a PDF document, so we can make sure um, that that is a part of this. So, but ultimately, there's a whole bunch of authorities that are in existence about uh, the, an expectation as well as the authority to collect data um, in a variety of different formats. Uh, and, and there are some general overarching goals um, and drivers that we adhere to and, and follow as a part of our belief and philosophy here at the department. Um, first and foremost, the privacy and security of student data is number one. Um, we might have heard the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, affectionately known as FERPA. Um, the, um, that sort of helps provide a frame around it, but it's a minimum. It's a minimum expectation. And so we take very seriously the importance of, of the privacy and, and security of the, of the, of the data. Um, we also subscribe to this notion of when possible, let's collect it once and use it often. And so that we reduce the burden on districts, reduce the burden on our stakeholders as a part of this work. But quite honestly, it reduces the burden on our staff when we can achieve that as well. Because now we've got, and we don't have multiple places where the data is, is um, residing. Um, we also believe that quality data leads to quality information. And that's sometimes not always the case. Um, and so we continue to aspire to find ways and mechanisms to help districts and help our staff um, achieve that goal. Uh, efficiency and coordination, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in some of the transformational pieces that we've been doing over the past several years. Um, around that efficiency and the coordination. Um, we've also termed this, this notion of source of truth. Um, instead of having multiple sources of potential answers, we work really hard um, at creating a, a perception and a, a practice that there's a single source of truth that we want to go to, that where, and where does that particularly um, truth reside. And, Finally, that you know, data in its base component are ones and zeros that all make up things. And, and ultimately, um, unless um, it's used effectively, um, it's really just that. And so what we've really tried to do over the past couple of years, uh, especially under the leadership of Matt and his team and staff, um, have been working really hard to figure out better, more effective and efficient ways to use the data um, as a tool for um, the schools and the community. So here's the, the other part of the history. Before 2007, we were primarily a paper-based collection place. Um, you may have heard stories about the wall of shame. So the commissioner at that time 
had everyone who sent out a form to a school uh, bring that paper <coughs> form and they taped it on a wall and it actually filled up both sides of the walls top to bottom all across right behind the commissioner's um, office and they called that the wall of shame and so they would have people walk through that wall and recognize that this is the amount of questions and burden we were providing to our school districts <coughs> on an annual basis. So it was that stimulus in addition to the, the need for us to be more efficient um, that we moved into a different realm and so with the help of a federal grant in 2007 we were able to implement the unique ID system um, and also essentially collect um, data at an individual student level that helped us get to that collect once and use in multiple ways. Um, it also helped to move forward um, the, the whole sort of digital collection of, of data as a part of our, our work. So <clears throat> jump ahead about five years, the implementation and the use of that Nebraska student and staff re record system, NSSRS or NISR sometimes as you might have affectionately heard it called. Um, we received another investment of federal resources um, to help us modernize some things in 2012. And so um, it was about the same time that there was this education data system study that occurred. From, it was the Legislative Resolution 264. And I want to share just a little bit about that for those that don't remember as well as for those that may not have ever seen this. But the Legislative Resolution basically um, asked the commissioner um, to do uh, an evaluation of the education data systems and the usefulness and the effectiveness in the state. And so um, we took um, a look at all of the education data systems, the teaching and learning systems, the back office systems, and the administrative systems, and we asked a number of questions and did a comprehensive study um, that looked at all of the pieces in this, in this particular um, frame. And through the focus groups and the surveys, we basically covered around 80% of the student population as far as the number of districts and so it was a comprehensive view of what was existing in the state. And We found that at that time, um, about five years ago, that our districts were spending over 655,000 hours a year sending us data. That was just to get us the data that we had requested from them and that was even in the digital format electronic manner. Um, we also found that um, with the software systems and the different licenses, um, in addition to the staff time, that we were spending about $100 million a year in providing um, that type of data and information to us here at the department. And the commissioner often joked at the time that that was crazy because it was, we were spending that amount of time to collect the data, to aggregate a report, tell the feds, wait a year for them to tell us what, how we're doing. Um, and so it really was a catalyst for us to focus on how we can be more actionable in the use of our data. So the federal investment that occurred in 2012 really was a catalyst for what we call ADVISOR. ADVISOR um, began as an acronym, it's an advanced um, data views informing students educational response. Um, it's now just ADVISOR. Um, it's our data system. Um, it's um, essentially an, a, a significant modernization of automating electronically uh, the, the data movement to the department directly from the student information systems. <coughs> um, we also at that time spent some time working with districts to help them better understand how to use data, um, building out our research and evaluation capacity, and thinking differently about um, our survey-based collections uh, through a tool called, called Qualtrics. So I, I'm, we started in 2012 with the implementation and the update of a, the advisor system. Um, the first full year is the one we're in right now where all school districts are actually on board providing us what we would characterize as this automated um, API connection from their student information systems into advisor. And so this is the first full year that we've ever utilized this system um, to its full extent. Special purpose schools too. And we've been able to engage the special purpose schools as a part of, of this work and um, the tool that's used by our, our um, interim program schools as well um, is also integrated with the connection. And so 
what that does is the second bullet point is that it enables what we characterize as this data ecosystem. Um, it creates an opportunity for data now that it's being submitted electronically to be also provided back to school districts in a more efficient and effective way. So a student enrolls in a school, um, they're able, their records are able to be electronically transferred and their services that they need and the types of systems of support that they have available to them from the previous district now can Im essentially immediately in real time be moved. We've, we've not <clears throat> fully implemented a lot of these aspirational pieces yet. Um, those are you know, contingent upon time and resources um, to help us move forward. But, but these are possibilities that the ecosystem now has created for us. Um, in addition, it creates what we call this interoperability, which our communications staff doesn't necessarily like that word. Um, but in the digital data geek world, the interoperability space is is simply the, the, the opportunity for the systems to talk to each other and to share data uh, more effectively and seamlessly as a part of that work. So <clears throat> the last two slides uh, from an update perspective, and we'll open up questions. I would have Matt kind of talk a little bit specifically about <laughs> some of the current advisor uses, um, essentially the data that comes in from advisor um, and how we've been able to and what we currently use um, for, use that data for. Sure. So uh, you all are probably familiar with the uh, recently revised Nebraska Education Profile website. <coughs> so I believe the commissioner shared that with you in the past. Uh, so advisor is one of the main feeders, obviously, for the new NEP site. We'll continue to make changes, exciting changes, actually, to that over the coming year, which you'll, you'll want to see um, when we release the new pieces of that. Uh, state and federal reporting, not all of it. There are other data collections across the department, but the vast majority of it now is being fed through advisor, which is uh, good. That includes much of the accountability data, not all of it, but much of the AQUEST-related accountability data comes there, too. Um, we continue to, to build out additional capacities around that system, such as the advisor dashboard. Uh, we have conversations about other opportunities, too, uh, there. Things that we could do around parent dashboards, things that we could do around um, a great deal of research and evaluation. Uh, we have a new partnership with the University of Nebraska at Omaha uh, where we're looking at uh, impacts of um, attendance information and its effect on student test scores. And a lot of that information is coming in now through Advisor. Uh, so it really enhances our research and evaluation capacity, which we've been trying to move forward as well. And then the continuous improvement process generally too. So Dean talked a little bit about the data cadre. We had some really nice um, uh, efforts with that a few years ago with our SLDS funding. Um, but I, one of the things that I want to underscore on a lot of this is that a lot of the resources that have been injected into this process have come thankfully from federal funds. Uh, but unfortunately we haven't received um, as much support on the state from the Nebraska state side. And so that's something that I think as we look in the future we'll continue to want to um, highlight um, because there are continuing changes, pieces that we will always need for this. I thought it was interesting when Don was talking about the accreditation piece, you know, I, they've been working on accreditation since 1860. So, you know, we've had uh, a yeah. digital data collection for less than 15 years is all. So uh, we probably have a lot of growing yet to do. It's nice that we had those federal grant injections, but we have to be able to sustain that over the long run. So those are some things we'll need. So finally, um, related to some future kind of data targets, and these are pieces that are essentially embedded within our ongoing commitment to the data collection process around student data privacy and security, um, this commitment to using data effectively and efficiently. Um, supporting the student transitions and and those are the transitions from facility to facility location to location those kinds of pieces this data ecosystem gives us the capacity um, to, to do those kinds of things uh, the action-based research the early warning signals the um, finance data and other kinds of things that help to inform policy and practice in a, in a way different way moving forward and, and ultimately, we're always looking for ways that we can reduce 
the reporting burden and, and identifying how we can make this more efficient and effective. Uh, one of the annual opportunities that we have um, is the data conference uh, where we're able to bring the data folks together. Um, and this year's conference is in, uh, at the end of April and, and ultimately in the theme of Champions for Equity in Education, um, better data, better decisions is the theme of the conference. And so um, the um, registration and pieces open. are, are yeah. open now. So. so with that, we'll stop, see if there's any questions or so Maybe one question started, I think I say at least some folks might have, but one of our kind of pain, could you highlight a couple of the pain points that we're kind of been aware of with, you know, school districts in the transition? Because I mean, I know that I've had superintendents hit me up and go, well, when's this gonna, you know, really work? There's, what are the types of pain points that, we're, that we've seen in the transition and, you know, kind of how are we working to help schools with those things? Sure. <clears throat> um, so, one of one of the um, commitments that that we made um, was to allow local choice and flexibility with regard to the student information systems that they want to use and so um, right now there are five six student information systems that are certified to provide data to advisor um, and so there's a couple of dynamics that are, are at play here because each of those five or six vendors um, are responsible for providing the connections that bring the data to us. And they each have capacities that are different. Um, and so that each of those takes time and provides things and the quality of their experiences at different levels. And so there's that kind of challenge of working um, with the vendors locally we, over the, the periods of implementation, have worked very hard directly with the vendors to help create a positive, congenial, visionary focus where we want to go and why we're doing what we're doing. And, but as with everything, there's, anytime there's a massive monumental shift, a, a transformational shift, quite honestly, um, there's going to be hiccups along the way in the implementation. And so I think that's maybe one of the, the, the pieces of this puzzle. Um, the other piece that sometimes I think gets um, disconnected is when you make a transition because of the, the high stakes element of the data, so like last year, it was essentially a parallel year. So what that means is, guess what, we're doing things twice. We're doing things the automated futuristic way and we're doing things the old fashioned way because we need to make sure there's fidelity and comparison and accuracy as a part of that work. And so anytime there's a change, um, there's that curve of pain, but ultimately as we come out of that curve of pain, we believe that the systems and infrastructure will be in a better place for us moving forward. C could I add into that too, yeah. Dean, that um, I think it's also important, Commissioner, for the board to understand that not everything is advisor, right? So what we're talking about there primarily is uh, student-related data that's collected for purposes of state and federal reporting. There are a lot of other collections that happen across the department for other reasons uh, that are not advisor. So when uh, a school district says, oh my gosh, what, you're, you want this and you want that and you want that, it's, it's not accurate to perfectly correlate that with, well, that's advisor, right? That could be this group sent out a certain application or there was a survey went out or how did you feel about this? Or, you know, the EBA process is a great example. Uh, that's not advisor, right? These are other things that happen collection. So there's a lot of collection of information that goes on. When it comes to that student information space that we're submitting to EdFacts and the feds, and others, um, advisor is significantly increasing efficiencies, and we'll, it will get better and better. But just don't <coughs> confound that with, well, data collection generally, because right. there, there are different things. And I was just going to highlight, I mean, and you, you hit on a couple of those major pain points, mm -hmm. but I think one of the other things that I want the board, I guess, to know relative to data collection, so we're changing also by 
federal regulation, the responsibility to collect data from a financial standpoint differently at a building level. So that one's taking place at the same time that we're doing these other elements. We're really looking at, because I think we've learned a lot through these processes, how we can better automate other data collections as well in the long run and have a set of data standards, especially like probably around the, any, well, I guess any of this, this element and how you work with the various multiple vendors. So we've had, we've come a long, long way. I mean, I appreciate Matt kind of talk. I actually think it's a miracle that we have this done because when I first started, I remember putting a budget request in for several million dollars to the legislature. That study was conducted and said we needed three, four million dollars a year to actually, when we got none of that money. And so if you actually think it's, it's been remarkable what has been able to be built in this time frame. So I, you know, a lot of credit to, to both Dean and Matt and the teams of people that have been doing that. But there are other data collections that I will say are still kind of in the old world thinking yet a little bit that are coming, you're gonna to have to come online to actually remove some of those pain points. And Robin earlier told me how much superintendents love change. So I think, yeah. <laughs> but there's just many. So I did tell me, I, I didn't know if Rachel had a question. I thought, yeah. Do you have a question? Well, not really significant, but I just wanna make sure I understand this. With, and I like the term ecosystem, I like that. Um, so if we took this ecosystem and compared it to the hall of shame or the wall of shame, there's a lot less forms that schools have to fill out. Would that be correct? So there's a lot less duplicative forms okay. that schools would have to fill out. So especially as it relates to the individuals or the student level based data. So that would be a fair way to Thank say Thank you, that. that answers my question. Which kind of gets to my question about the pain and the shame and all of those <laughs> things. And that's really understanding and being able to differentiate the, the data collection issues that have been resolved by advisor versus those data collection issues that are still out there. Because I believe what I've heard from some of my schools is um, a sense that moving forward with advisor would reduce the burden of data collection. And I don't think that's happening because of these other kinds of data requests that may be different than student information advisor. And sometimes those requests may be duplicative in some components because there may be a student information component and I don't know if all of those have been linked across data requests or if there's a perception when a, uh, information a uh, data request comes in for a report for whatever federal program or whatever that there may be student data points that are requested in that report that are actually in advisor but we haven't done that cross check so I don't know if one that's done and two if we can have a better understanding of what are those other um, data collection issues that are out there and are they <coughs> federal programs predominantly or are there some state are they statutory what's creating <coughs> this um, data reporting concern that is still out there I think you guys have done an amazing job in moving forward with the advisor and the student data element <coughs> but there's still maybe this other pool of data out there that's causing some angst in our schools. If we could understand what that is and how we move forward or what request for funding uh, to try to get that resolved, I think would be very beneficial yeah, for our and we'll, schools. And we'll need some advocacy on the, again, we keep asking for resources around certain things. So differences now compared to what I think have even happened, the expectations of accountability of results relative to federal funds. A very different environment than where we just used to check on 
did you spend the funds the way you said you would, right? Mm -hmm. So there's right. kind of changes that are taking place. The, the, the base system, as we kind of keep building it, it, it does have to continue to be connected. So there's other investments to be made as we build that out around that philosophy. And that's hard for schools to understand. And then you throw on, we're gonna collect finance data from, you know, from a building level. Right. Then you throw on some other things along those lines. The other thing I get, I, I've told Dean, that this is my other great line from the past, I guess, but Dean, I say, Dean, I don't know if you're all worried about this data thing's just a fad, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> oddly enough, just like computers have done, I think for society generally, you know, everybody said, well, how much less there would be to do on a whole lot. Instead, it actually creates more demand for information. And so it feels like to me that every time there's a new funding source, a new, and we've talked about grants management system and other things, every time there's a new expectation around that, they add just little elements of expectations for those funds. And I think that's the pressure point for, mm -hmm. for a lot of this work. And I, I don't have a great list. I don't expect Dean and Matt have a great list of all those things right now. But that is very much the work that we have underway now to, to keep taking the student data side and now it gives us a chance to build around that philosophy at least so one thing I may add just to that point is we are undertaking a sort of a, a reprise of the original education data study so the study that was released in 2014 is now five years old and it had a five-year roadmap and so we're in the process of conducting that study again um, for two, with two lenses. One is what progress did we make and what impact did we have on the amount of time and is it more efficient? Is it more effective? Did we save money? Did we increase the cost? Um, the other part of that then is what are the pain points that we need to really prioritize so that we can lay out the next five year um, roadmap on what we need to do to provide supports and investments um, moving forward. Um, the, the second piece to your, your point is the whole evaluation of data collections and that whole kind of governance associated to what data elements and what are the requirements and where that all is happening is something that we're kind of going through a continuous improvement process ourselves and updating our expectations around the review of those resources, the data collections themselves, and creating an element of transparency um, and thoughtful strategic prioritization of those particular resources as well. So um, that's, that's something that's very much on our, on our list of things to accomplish to, to address what you're describing. Well, so thank you, Dean and Matt, for taking this time. I hope, okay. yeah. Thanks. And I, I guess it's not a fad is what I've learned, so. <laughs> So uh, um, last but not least on my, um, um, pre my presentation, I'll put it that way, uh, Jeremy Henniger. I asked Jeremy and I guess Corey, it looks like Corey's going up too, so um, to present a little bit on the, the timeline on the assessment work. And obviously, probably one more pain point, right, relative to how quickly we can turn around reporting. And, and I, I wanted you to have a kind of a, a bit of the historical perspective, policy choices we've made along the way. Um, over the last several years and the importance of those things and then kind of a bit of how we imagine this coming together for the future. So, so I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Uh, for the record, uh, Section Director of Statewide Assessment, Jeremy Henniger. I'm Corey Epler, Academic Officer and Administrator for the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Assessment. And if you thought the data conversation from Matt and Dean was exciting, just wait because Jeremy is just going to knock your socks off this afternoon. So. Uh, high expectations there. Um, <laughs> great. Um, I, uh, being fourth in this list, right. I was really worried about that. If anybody would still, still be awake, so I'll see if I can wake everybody up a little bit. So um, like the commissioner said, uh, we thought it was a, a good time to bring this information forward to try to let everybody know. Everybody's interested in assessment reporting dates. Um, our districts are concerned about it and want to know when that's going to happen. The board is interested, the media is interested, other staff in the department are interested because our dates 
impact everybody else's dates, whether that's accountability or putting things out in the NEP for the public. And so I uh, wanted to try to give some context for where we are and why we're uh, here, but also give some information about where we expect to be moving forward. So hopefully I can answer some of those questions um, and, and give some information that, that kind of sets this up and explains why we're where, why we're where we are right now. So. Um, uh, last year was our first year of NSCAS, so the Nebraska Student-Centered Assessment System. Pre previous to that, we had NISA, the Nebraska uh, State Accountability Tests, um, and, and so we had a, a big change last year. Um, and, and we really wanted to focus on student-centered when we talked about that. So we, we started talking about not only a statewide assessment, but we talked about um, how do we support, from the department's position, balanced assessment for all our districts? We, we can't necessarily make a balanced assessment system, but we can support different aspects of that. Um, one of the big decision points um, that came through that process um, when we moved our uh, general assessment in grades three through eight from our previous vendor to NWA was to make those adaptive tests. So in ELA, for English language arts and for mathematics, we changed to adaptive testing. Um, and so adaptive tests, basically, as students are engaged in that test, the, uh, the questions either get easier if students are missing questions or harder if students get them correct. So it's adapting to the student's level, uh, level in real time. So it's a computer adaptive test. Um, the couple of advantages to that, there, and there, there are several. Um, so that it's adjusting to meet students at their particular level, um, which uh, lowers the frustration level for many of our kids, not only for kids that may be overwhelmed with difficult questions, right, but also for our students that didn't find those tests challenging because it challenges them where they are. And so because of that, it also increases student engagement in those items because they're not likely to find them boring or overwhelming. It's more likely to meet them where they are. Um, a second part of the student centered is the goal to, um, and if you look at the RFP, it was very clear that we wanted to return um, results sooner, right? And, and, and that way we could inform uh, instructional decisions um, and reinforce NDE's uh, equity commitment. Um, so um, not only should we get that, that information back, but we can understand our students who's uh, achieving, who's not achieving, and we were able to address those, those particular needs. And so the overall question is, where are we in achieving this goal? So I, I think it's important to understand that last year was the first year of this move, and we made a lot of changes last year. And, and we knew um, going into that year that the, the reporting dates um, were gonna be pushed back for several reasons. One of the big reasons um, were setting cut scores for mathematics. So the, we had to go through a process last summer and, and then ultimately come up through the department, through the commissioner for a recommendation to the board to be approved in August. All of those things have an impact on it. So we knew we were gonna be later last year. Where are we this year? Where are we going to be in the future that's kind of the the what i'm trying to answer with uh, with our presentation today um, so some background information just so everybody's kind of on the the same page um, equating is the process we use in in assessment to make sure that the results from year to year mean the same thing so if i'm a, if i'm a fourth grade student and i get a 125 that's just a made-up number by the way but if i get a 125 and a new for, another fourth grade student takes the test next year and they get a 125, equating is the process that we use to make sure those 125s mean exactly the same thing and are not, because the students will not take the same test, right? Um, and so we, want it, we have to make sure that those tests essentially means the, mean the same thing. Um, there's two types of equating, post-equating, which by its name is completed after the test, right? Um, there's less risk with post equating because we get all of this, we get a whole other administration's worth of information to make sure that everything we know about them statistically in those t the questions, the items, students and the student responses are, are stable, we understand it and there's, so there's less risk. Obviously with post equating, it's happening afterwards, it pushes those results later and that we can return back to <coughs> districts, schools, students, parents. Um, all of those different uh, stakeholders that are interested in them. Pre-equating, on the other hand, obviously, is before the test. Um, and it's based on statistics that we uh, pull from field testing or previous administration. So we're looking at item statistics, um, and, and, and so it's based on uh, that information. It's less 
um, there's less information and so it's a riskier process because things can change from administration to administration. And so uh, pre-equating pre um, sounds good and it is good and it can work, um, but uh, there is some more risk involved. Last year with our administration, um, the psychometricians, those people that are way smarter than I am as far as uh, measurement goes in mathematics, um, they recommended, uh, we had to do, uh, I'll put it this way, we had to do post-equating last year because it was the first year. We couldn't do it any other way but to post-equate. The goal, the hope was that we could move to pre-equating this year so that we could get return results quicker. Unfortunately, there was, for lack of getting very technical with you, which I don't want to do um, because it may make me sound like I don't know what I'm talking about and we would hate for that to happen. Um, but, but, <laughs> um, but there was a lot of noise in the system last year with it's the first year, first year of moving to a new vendor, a new platform, a new computer-based system. There was a lot of noise in the system. So the psychometricians recommended, not only the psychometricians from NWA, our vendor, but the psychometricians that we had in consult consultations with uh, the department recommended that we do post-equating one more year to get another batch of data to make sure when we move to pre-equating that we're comfortable with all the decisions that we made. And so uh, we thought we were gonna, we wanted to get to pre-equating this year. We were not able to do that. So we're still in a post-equating world for this year. And so that's gonna still impact some of the dates that I'm gonna give you here in a minute. Also, uh, talk about this. Earlier I mentioned we made a decision. We, meaning everybody that was uh, in this room at the time and the department itself and districts that had a, a, a say in what we were doing, asked us to move to adaptive testing. It's important to know that that decision has an impact as well. So we used to be in the fixed form world, right? So the fixed form me me means that all the students in a sp specific grade level took the same test. If I was a fourth grade ELA student, all the fourth grade ELA students across the entire state took the same test. Um, those items were specifically selected when we were making that form, that form of the test. Um, and also know that raw scores at the time were immediately available. So when a student got done with that test on a computer, um, we returned back a raw score to, to the, the school that said the student got X number of questions correct out of X number possible. So they got a percent correct almost immediately um, in the computer-based system. When we move to the adaptive test, there's some great things about it, like I mentioned before, but basically it customized the test for every student. So if you have 23,000 students in a grade level, which we have approximately, that means that there's actually 23,000 different tests being given in fourth grade ELA. And so what we went from one to 23,000. Um, compared to fixed form, it requires about 10 times as many items. That also means when I'm doing that pre-equating, post-equating, I'm doing calculations from uh, say 300 items to 3,000 items. Um, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me is when the psychometricians talked about how much time those calculations took um, in, um, after last year's test, um, one, one of, uh, of, of calculations that they did took 12 computing days, so it took 12 continuous days of computing processing times to do the calc one of the one set of calculations for this because we have 23,000 different tests going on and we need to make sure all of that is um, being done correctly for the student's sake so that we, when we return I, uh, uh, results that those are accurate results. Um, it's also important to know that a raw score is available. So when a student's finished with this test, I could tell you how many, student, how many questions they got right, how many questions they got wrong. The problem with that, because the test is adapting, right, um, that, that information is less useful than it was on the fixed form world. So for, for example, Corey's doing really well on the test. He's getting really difficult questions. He's missing very few questions. So overall, he has harder, much harder questions um, than I would, because I'm struggling a little bit. I'm getting question, more questions wrong. Um, in the end, Corey and I can end up with the same percentage of questions correct, right? But because Corey had much more difficult questions on this adaptive test than I did because I was struggling, his score is going to be significantly higher than mine even though the percentage correct is the same. And so turning a raw score around to schools 
is somewhat problematic in that it can be easily misinterpreted because we might get the same raw score, but our overall level, our performance level is very different in the end. So the, the easy data that we were able to turn around back in the fixed form world is not the same easy data that we could turn around now. And because that's easily misunderstood, we've made the decision not to share that raw score right away because it's so easily misunderstood. So that's important to understand as well. Um, so talking about a little bit about our tests. So all of our tests have a specific number of item slots, right? How many questions can you fit on a test? Um, uh, everybody's worried about how long these tests take. We're very cognizant of that and we want to make them as short as we can, but still as effective as we can in giving information uh, back. And so uh, item slots, first of all, we have op operational items filling those operational slots. Um, those count towards a student score, just like you would in any test that a student takes. Um, for instance, there might be uh, 48 items on the, uh, or 58 items on the test. 40, 80 of them might be operational items. So those all count towards the student's final score, right? We also have field test items that we, we, we plug into this. They're called embedded field test items. Instead of giving a whole different test, we embed questions that don't count for the student, um, but are basically we're testing the items instead of testing the students. And so those items can be put into the item bank for future use. Students, the great thing about that is a student doesn't know which is operational, which is field test, so they're trying just as hard as they normally would. But we're basically using that to increase the number of items in our item bank to make it so we have a more robust item bank, a better uh, functioning item bank. Um, so those items are put in there um, on a regular basis. We've been doing that for years for the ongoing maintenance of our test system, okay? Um, also, we have linking items, and linking items may or may count towards a student's uh, score depending on how the design is done. But basically, those are used for equating and establishing and maintaining a vertical scale. So those items um, are basically common. So if, if all those fourth grade students have 58 questions, a small number of them might be the same across um, all of those students because we need to make sure um, those are the items that we use to understand um, uh, the pre-equating process, post-equating processes, and making sure our vertical scales are working the way that they're supposed to. I mentioned all of that because we, we, as we go into this year, as we went into this year, we had to make decisions about how we use those item slots. So the operational ones are already, are already set, right? We had to decide, do we uh, focus more on field test items or linking items because we only have a set number of those, okay? So uh, when we were making that decision, we focused on stability, so making sure that the vertical scale that we put in place last year is working, which allows students to see and uh, schools to see growth from grade level to grade level, so we, we focused on that stability there. Long-term health of the program, so making sure the item bank supports students at all levels. Um, so when we went from fixed form world to adaptive world, we needed all of a sudden many more questions than we had previously. Um, what we found as we started to look at this is that students on the high end had less questions that they needed to, to, to challenge them. And so when we were looking at the item bank this year and item writing with our teachers, we focused on more difficult questions so that they got the questions they needed to be engaged and to get more information back. So we focused on that. So the long-term health of the program means the long-term health of the item bank. Okay, and then also know that we have lots of processes as we moved into last year and this year is to making making sure that when we return scores, we have quality processes and that we can rely upon that we don't have um, incorrect data going out that we then have to pull back and then change uh, for people. So all of that is going into the dates. So the, the dates that we have here. So. Um, on, on this, the first two um, rows are probably the most important. Uh, of, the, of the chart. Um, so the first is the preliminary data and the second is the final data. You can see the first column there is 2017 reporting dates uh, and, the, and the dates that we hit last year, right? So on 9-5-18, uh, districts saw their preliminary data for the, la for, the, for the first time. And then on 10-19-18, uh, when we were able to uh, give them final data, and then we had to do all of the AQUEST and all the reporting processes um, that we needed to do in-house so that we could get to the public reporting. 
the dates that we are proposing for this year, you'll see in the second column that are bolded. Um, you see not 8 5 19 and 8 26 19. Those are uh, earlier than last year. They're not as early as we want. And we've heard from you, we've heard from others that really we want to get results, preliminary results back to districts by 6 1. Um, that wasn't doable for this year. Uh, we looked at it and we tried really hard to see if we could make those dates. Um, you'll see the, the proposed or the draft dates for next year um, would be 6-1 and 7-6. So those <coughs> dates get uh, quite a bit earlier for next year and year three because we're able to move to pre-equating next year. Um, you'll notice there is an asterisk there because I don't want to come out and say these are officially the dates we're going to hit them 100% because they are dependent on a stable administration for this year, right? So uh, the, the test window opens up on March 18th. Um, if everything goes the way that we anticipate it will, we have no reason to think that it won't. But we still have those dates are dependent on everything happening the way that we, we want to. Even though what we th we think we're going to make those dates, and, and I should point out, we're also putting uh, the the six one date in the contracts as we work through the contracts um, for this year. Um, it's also important to know that we still don't think this is early enough, right? If I'm making decisions on the part of a district, I need earlier, even earlier results because by six one. I've already set my schedule for next year. I've done a lot of the work that I'm going to do as a, as, as a district. So um, know that and for spring 2020, this is what we're working with. So we're working with NWA to make sure that preliminary scores are, are, are turned around almost immediately to students. Okay. So we, after that, we might have business rules that need to clean up and, and re clean those up for reporting in those pieces. So it might be possible that a student could get a preliminary score and then that would be suppressed for final reporting because some business rule happens that that would happen with. Um, but that, that is our intention is to turn around those. Um, we're still the, trying to figure out if that means within 24 hours, whether that means immediately on the student screen or whether that means 48 hours, but basically right in there that, that those results would be almost turned around almost, almost immediately to the district so that they have information, at least preliminary information, to be making instructional decisions, to be making decisions about um, programming for students and all of those types of things. So the last slide here. Um, and I wanted just to update everybody on this so that you know when you get a chance to um, have a say in some of these processes, right? And so th this month we, we let the Teaching and Learning Committee know that we're working on contracts for our three big assessment vendors, ACT for the high school, um, NWA for the general assessments in three through eight, and DRC for the alternate assessments. Um, working with all three of those, um, in April we plan to have a, as a discussion item those three contracts, and then hopefully in May we'll have an action item for those three big contracts as well. Um, that date, that 6-1 um, uh, date, we're working on actually putting that date into all of those contracts. And if they, we can't make those dates for a very good reason, say in 2021 when we do science and we have to set cut scores, that they'll have that information in the contract. So you'll see those when you approve those, those big contracts. So that's a lot of information. I probably spoke way too fast, but um, there we go. Sorry, I'm getting tired. Um, we're going to have a second year of post-equating. Did I hear that right? Correct. This okay. year, this current year we're in is a second year of post-equating. Okay. Yep. And then when you're talking about item numbers, you had operational field tests linking items. The operational items are a set number and the other two are variable numbers. The Correct. So the test is the same length all, every year for right. every student, but those numbers could be um, manipulated between field test numbers and linking or field test items and, and linking items, um, depending on what our priority is. So in the next year, we'll probably um, emphasize linking because of that pre-equating, so we can start the checks earlier and less on field test. Um, but they, they those can be manipulated based on the priority for a, a given year. Yes. Okay, but operational will always be a set number. C well, it, it, it 
currently it is. Um, technically with adaptive, we may be able to get to the point where in the future that we could actually make the test shorter. Um, we're, 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 we're a few years away from that because it requires a lot of data to be able to make those types of decisions. Um, and, and so I, I don't want to make any promises, but that's the potential of adaptive testing is you can actually make testing shorter because you can get to where the student's level is faster. Um, and that's what happens on map growth testing that NWA runs, but they are also talking about many more thousands of worth of students and many more years in their program. And so uh, the data that we need, we need to be, we have, we need to have a lot more data to be able to make those decisions as we move forward. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. So now my question is kind of simplistic. Can you make that simplistic? Um, because I think to be able to communicate to constituents, yeah. uh, the complexity of what you just shared yeah. uh, in a way that, that helps to understand the rationalization of this delayed time period that will occur for another year to, to two years in getting results back is really important. And if that can be put out in a way that is very simplistic for even parents and non-educators to understand, I think would be really valuable. Because that, that was pretty complex. It is very complex. And, and, and it's very, co very informative. It, it, it's complex, complex because the whole thing is complex, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just it just is, right? Because I'd love to make those dates earlier. And I, and I worked really hard with NWA to try to get them earlier. Um, one thing that I mentioned about is the commissioner uh, has asked um, us to, to work on a letter that's going to come out to, to uh, schools to explain this in a, a more simplistic fashion. Um, but also know that um, with our district assessment contacts, our DACs, we're also planning on doing a, a recording of this because there are people that understand this and can communicate some of these pieces out to uh, others as well. So we're working on those communication pieces. I think doing a letter for parents also so that okay. schools have that sample letter is so they don't have to try to um, put it in that more sure. simplistic fashion would yep. be really helpful. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I agree with the communication uh, to parents and administrators. Um, I work with the Citizens Academy in the, in the school system in LPS, and um, they ask me all kinds of questions about this. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I, I was like, well, um, I'll try my hardest to find out the answers, you know, that kind of thing. So if we could be proactive with that and Absolutely. get them to understanding. Okay, so, and this is probably, um, you'll probably laugh at my question, no, but not. that'll be all right. <laughs> okay, so um, you made this statement, you talked about raw scores and that they were available right after the test. And I did not think that sounded very complex when you explained that to me compared to a lot of other things. And so you also stated right after that, you decided not to share raw scores right away um, because you didn't think there would be an understanding of that. But understanding that Corey had an easier test and you had a more difficult test or vice versa, mm -hmm. telling me that as a parent and that my son's raw score was the same as his, even though you know, he took an easier test, to me, that makes perfect sense because you're getting more difficult questions. And so if you hand me the raw score, plus I don't know that I would even know Corey's score. Yeah. You know so, what I'm saying? Yeah, so typically those don't go to parents. Those actually just go to teachers. So if I'm looking, so the, the, the problem is that the, that the teachers don't know which questions the student had at the time, right? So they, they may anticipate because Corey typically gets better grades than I do that he's gonna get more difficult questions, but that's not always necessarily the case because we often have students that achieve over their grade, you know, <laughs> beyond what they get for grades because they might care for this particular test or they just tried harder today, or students that are struggling um, uh, with a test but get good grades. And so the teachers can't see which level of difficulty the questions are. So it's more informative to turn around and what the intention is for year three is to turn around the performance level, not only the, the, the scale score and what level that is, but whether the student is at developing on track or the CCR benchmark, because that information is much more informative um, 
for for teachers and for parents um, because we also have ALDs, achievement level descriptors that describe each one of those levels and the abilities of students, uh, the typical abilities of each of those students. Um, in general, I think it's, it's e I, and this is my interpretation of this, it's, it's hard for people to see the difference if we both got a 50% in the end, why we would get a different grade, a grade or a performance level. Um, I, I think that that's where we've been in. Anyway. Yeah. I just thought maybe you would quell some of that, uh, that why are we not getting these back if you did that explanation statement yeah. and said, and the final scores will be arriving. Sure. And I, I don't know, but it just seemed like I had a lot of parents who were like, Whoa. Oh, yeah. On the edge. Well, and they definitely want, it, and, and they 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 want and they deserve earlier results. Yeah. Um, getting the ch all the changes we had, it just takes what I'd say is it takes more time to get to where we want to be, and, and we can't just do it automatically because we need all the data to be able to do those things. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Robin. It, I, so am I. am I. Do I do my eyes look a little glazed? <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's not your problem. You know that letter she's talking about? Uh -huh. Send me one of okay, those. Okay. Uh -huh. And and okay, just some quick questions. Sure. ACT we give to eleventh graders. Yeah. Okay. Third year cohort the, students, it, it, but which are typically eleventh graders. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. <laughs> NWEA maps uh, give to. That is a choice for districts. We provide it free of. We provide we we pay for the cost for grades three through eight, um, in 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 map growth. But districts decide who and how often take that test. And then what was the what was the third one that you mentioned? Yeah. So the the DRC Data Recognition Corporation they provide the alternate test. So that alternate test is for grades uh, three through eight and eleven. But it's typically for students that have significant cognitive disabilities, and that's typically about one percent of our students. If I say all alternative testing that, is that that's sufficient yeah all right uh, I'm, can i just I'm, clarify yes, the, the nwa the there's the map growth component component which is the interim but they also um are doing the summative for us too so map growth is not the summative um there it's is in scas correct yes yeah. so the in is not optional right, right. All, all the kids in grades three three through eight have to take those tests the map growth is a separate interim piece that focuses on growth more than anything else, and that's optional. And and all of these are aligned with our uh, standards, the ones that have been completed? Yep, yeah, that is correct. That's correct. All right, and then what we're doing with these is to modify instruction and um, provide for maybe staff development and that sort of thing. Is, is the... Is, does it do, is it a value in your opinion to label schools because of the results of these tests? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, good, good it, questions it, it, are those it, it, we really it, it, don't. I, I don't like good that. questions I'm are really. I'm going to throw that one to good, the commissioner, good, actually. Really, good <laughs> questions are really those that we just don't know the answer to, and I appreciate that. It's and I'm, being, I'm, I'm pushing the envelope on this, and I apologize no, I, for that. And commissioner, you don't even have to uh, <laughs> provide. I. I, I'm getting to a point here uh, that assessments drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll leave it at that for right now, uh, because we know that assessments tell us more than anything. Granted, I appreciate the fact that they are intended to help teachers become better teachers, to provide kids with better instruction. I get that, but that sort of thing. But unfortunately, when we start to get into labeling, and I understand that's not you, and, and really I know it's not the commissioner either, we, we get from things on high. But, but really what we, we have found is that regardless of what assessment we use, we have found out that the higher the socioeconomic status of a student, the, the greater the opportunity to do well, and uh, the opposite uh, shows the other way. And, and uh, my soapbox uh, is not, is still growing, and so I'll <laughs> keep, keep hammering on that. Yeah. But I, I'm just really concerned. Um, and, and guys, I, I can't even imagine how you guys think. It's, it's amazing to me. 
It's scary. <laughs> yeah, your ability to, to take data and do things with it. I, I just I appreciate that. I hope this is a quick question, and you didn't laugh at the other one. But what kind of information does the NSCAS provide that the map does not? Because I hear over and over from teachers that they prefer the map. So why, what's the difference, and why are we doing two? So um, that's, a, that's a good question as well. So the, the map growth um, does a better job of turning results around um, than our test. Our test is designed to be a summative test. And, and, and if you look back at the history of that piece, um, it was it was put into place, a statewide assessment was put into place. Um, if you look at the law for accountability purposes and the purposes of compare, uh, being able to compare schools and districts to one another. Um, that was, and so it was originally designed for that intention. Um, last year with the big change with the, the change to Nebraska student-centered assessment system is to trying to do more with and providing more information back. The, the, the fact is that the, our test is very short and because it's short, so it, for instance, our ELA test is only 48 questions long. Um, if you look at the number of standards that covers, um, uh, it's, there's a lot of standards there and to be able to give reliable results on all of those indicators underneath there, our test would have to be a lot long, a lot longer to give good results back. Um, so not only does it provide a summative test, uh, but it also does provide um, some sub uh, scores as well. So for ELA, for instance, we provide a vocabulary score, a reading comprehension score, and a writing skill score. Um, so there is some uh, sub pieces of that. Um, what I would tell you is that the the uh, a summative test should only be looked at in conjunction with other measures that are going on, whether that's grades, whether it's interim benchmark, um, whether it's formative test results, because it is it is a point in time test, and it's good for un identifying um, certain aspects, um, but it needs to be looked at holistically with a lot of other evidence as well, because it can't answer all of the questions that we have. And so it's not a good measure of a school success. Or failure. It shouldn't be used as the only measure. The only. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. So, to Robin, we own that. When you say oh, those people somewhere else, that would be us. So, I, I'm just going to tell you mm -hmm. we have to think about what we're doing. We've established the criteria for classification. We have to visit or revisit how we're waiting, how we're looking at these processes. So I think it's important to understand we as a board are the ones that approved the current classification system that we have in place. If there are things about we approve the contract for the assessment system that we have in place, uh, yes, there's statutory elements that moved us in this direction but there are also opportunities that we have to reevaluate where we are and what we do for classification of schools around AQUEST and what level of weighting we put into assessment as a part of that process. So we kind of own that. Now, granted, I think that's an important topic that has elements of compromise and lots of things to come into play, but but it's probably important that we revisit that at some point. Uh, one, at least to truly understand what it is that, that we as a board, a previous board, so to speak, approved, and to what this current board wants to do moving forward and, and understand that process. The other piece, I think, continuing to spend some time in understanding adaptive, and that's such a complex concept, and I think you did a really good job in explaining adaptive, but again, uh, to explain it to, to a parent, um, you know, to me it's more about understanding that Corey can do uh, 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 tri triple digit addition and Jeremy, you haven't mastered single digit <laughs> addition, you know. It, it, we, it we've got to get down actually. to that <laughs> level tough. of specificity yeah. to understand that, that adaptive is looking at where you're at right now mm -hmm. in particular skill sets and where another student is. And I think the more we can help people start to understand that concept, 
the more they can start to understand, oh, isn't that kind of cool? There's a test that starts to, to look at that and almost customizes to that student-centered approach. So. Um, just to point out, we have a three, it's about a three minute video that was intended for students and mm -hmm. therefore others as well that explains a computer adaptive test. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it was on the information. Like the elementary it, level students. Yeah, actually, absolutely it was. Yeah. Um, um, and I think it was on the information sheet, but I can, we can send that out to you again if you want to take a look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick question. Microphone. The, oh, sorry. All these math things are biting in my head <laughs> right now. But as far as the math test, we only require it once in elementary school. And if the teacher chooses to do it more often to be a better instructor, that's their choice, right? Correct. So when you say elementary, that's grades three through six? Uh, depends on how they define their elementary. In their district. Correct. Okay. And then it's required somewhere in the middle school Correct, and it's, Just not, once, and it's right? not necessarily map growth. They could use any norm reference test, and so they could be choosing a, a different test like the Terra Nova or the Stanford 9. Or, um, okay. Uh, so we, we, we provide one option for them because of our big contract that we have, um, but they could choose a different test if they wanted to to report. But the, as far as norm reference tests that they have to report, it's one, one time, one grade in elementary, one grade in middle school, we took away the high school requirement because we're using the, the ACT. 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 Yeah. So that's one thing. We're only requiring one in elementary, one in middle school. Other teachers, and this mm. made me think for you, Robin, they do that to make themselves better instructors to meet the needs of their students. Especially with maps, you know exactly where they're weak and exactly how to help them. So we have since for quite a while cut back on it on assessments the way it used to be right so we have cut back but maybe not enough I don't know thank you Jeremy thank you very much for all that you've done for us thank you for the briefing and the board will take a break until four o'clock so,
standing committee reports. And if we could have, we're going to start out with Lisa Fricky. Please report on the AQUEST Teaching and Learning Domain Committee meeting, please. I'd be happy to do that. Um, our committee is bringing forth two items today. The first one is discussion of item 3.4.A in regards to uh, the Nebraska World Language Standards. And Corey Epler and Stephanie Call are going to provide us with some more information about this. So there they are. Welcome, and thank you for being here to talk to us about this. You're welcome. Well, um, we're excited to be here. I assured John that we have a, about a 90-minute presentation today, so settle was, in. And I was asking for two hours, but you broke it down. To <laughs> I, I'm coming up short as usual, so sorry. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll note that. Um, I'm Corey Epler, Academic Officer and Administrator for the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Assessment. Stephanie Call, World Language Specialist. And we're here today to talk about the revision to Nebraska's World Language Standards and uh, a really exciting opportunity for us is uh, the current uh, essential learning standards have not been revised since 1996. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that process, but as we start, um, uh, it seems the trend today has been to talk a little bit about our statutory responsibility and some of the uh, mechanisms that we currently have in place. So I just wanted to um, start off with the law that, there, that exists around content area standards development and the state board's responsibility. Um, Nebraska revised statute um, indicates that the state board shall approve uh, content area standards in reading, writing, mathematics, science, and social studies, and that those standards should be revised every seven years. However, we have a commissioner who continues to challenge us to think beyond the minimums. So despite those um, standards that are required by law, we do have content area standards for all content areas um, that are taught in an instructional program in our school. So there are fine arts standards, there are physical education standards, world language standards, um, health education, career and technical education standards as well. Um, districts are not required to um, adopt these content area standards. Um, thinking about the conversation of what's in Rule 10. What we find, though, is that as we um, provide the framework for quality teaching and learning through these content area standards, that districts do use these standards even though they are not required by law to utilize those. One thing that I also wanted to mention, and I do have hard copies, is that over the last several years we've worked to provide transparency around when content area standards will be revised. This has uh, been on our website um, for a couple of years now, but um, our hope is that as districts are looking at this timeline, we recognize that many of them are making decisions around curriculum, um, around textbook adoption, and aligning it with our content area standards revision timeline. So um, we divide it into the areas that are assessed by the summative assessment, ELA math and science, um, the uh, content areas not assessed by summative as well as the career and technical education content areas as well. We do work to use a consistent process ac across all content areas and I think it's important to note that we do use educators to write our standards. Uh, we draw educators across all different levels of uh, our pre-K through uh, post-secondary system, ensuring that there's representation from big schools, small schools, and across the state of Nebraska. A big piece of our work with standards is ensuring that they meet expectations for um, post-secondary readiness and that uh, when mastered, students have an opportunity to be successful in post-secondary coursework without the need for remediation. So we do engage our post-secondary experts in all of our standards revision processes. Um, we are always making sure that our standards are research-based, um, that they are factual, and that they are strong in content. Um, and that is, uh, in part, helped by our post-secondary experts that are in the, in the room, as well as other nationally recognized resources as well. We always engage employers in the process, recognizing that it's not just college readiness, but ensuring that the, uh, there is an intentional conversation around career readiness. 
Um, a big piece of this too is um, not only communication with you, but how we consider and incorporate public input and feedback as appropriate. So ensuring that there's an open line of conversation um, between us and not only yourselves as the board, but also with all stakeholders, educators, parents, uh, employers, um, uh, really anyone that wants to provide feedback with that. So we do use a consistent process across all content area standards. I wanted to reference, and I have hard copies here as well, um, again, over the last couple of years, we've worked to clarify um, the, the why behind standards, because I think sometimes it exists, why do we need content area standards? So we went to the research and we uh, developed a reference guide that gives a little bit of uh, background around the standards-based movement. Um, it also clarifies our process for revising standards. Um, it talks more specifically around um, uh, our quality checklist, which you see on the right, which is also in the document. Um, I think that's one thing that's really important to note that um, we often have questions around the quality of our standards, but we feel really confident that our standards are research-based and the quality criteria that we ensure are in the standards is backed by the research from educational psychology, human cognition, teaching and learning, etc. So um, uh, we don't just put a set of standards before you without ensuring a, a very uh, a thoughtful and intentional quality uh, check process. Um, and the checklist, again, is in here as well as the research that talks about why those six criteria make up our quality um, checklist. Uh, we had a really good conversation in committee this morning about talking about the differences between standards versus curriculum. Um, and maybe surprisingly or not surprisingly, mm. there's a lot of um, maybe confusion might be the word around the difference between standards and curriculum. One thing that I think is important to call out at this point is that standards are not curriculum. And I think that's something that's really important to help not only our educators understand, but our administrators need to understand and parents need to understand. Um, we have definitions for standards, which I often say reflect the what we want students to know and be able to do. The curriculum, is the how. So how do they, how does a, a professional in a classroom, in a, in a experience actually help students learn the content? Um, and in a curriculum, you'll also see instructional materials, which might be textbooks, which might be online resources, um, which um, are determined locally. So I'll also say textbooks are not curriculum. Um, and so we start to see the difference between um, how we talk about standards versus curriculum and then the instructional materials that are included in part of a locally determined curriculum. To help us communicate, we have this graphic that we've shared often, and it's in the standards reference guide. The top two layers um, highlight what the State Board of Education approves, which are standards and indicators. And the pieces below that are determined by local school districts and classroom teachers. So whereas the board will approve standards and indicators for all content areas, the local districts actually determine the local instructional materials, the curriculum, getting down to lesson plans and specific strategies for individual students. Now that doesn't mean that the department does not provide resources and support around instructional materials materials or curriculum. Uh, we see that it's a, a, a really strong commitment to equity, to ensuring that districts are um, putting the best possible resources in students' hands. So over the last uh, year and a half, we've really worked to increase our presence around helping districts identify what's high quality um, and ensuring alignment to standards, because that is just a huge equity piece that we really need to be ensure of. Do all kids have an opportunity to learn the high quality instruction materials? And I think that's something that we're committed to. So. Again, standards are not curriculum. You all are not approving curriculum. You are approving the standards from which curriculum will be built. We built. And again, we talked more about some additional information that may come forward down the road um, around those two pieces. Okay, I felt like I just went whoo uh, through all of that and maybe got on my own soapbox around that. But uh, we want to transition a little bit to some of the specifics around world language instruction in Nebraska. Um, before we talk about the world language standards, the question from the committee last month was, let's look, hear a little bit more about the context of language instruction in Nebraska. Um, so in Rule 10, uh, relative to the K-12 instructional program requirements, districts are required to offer two um, years worth of language instruction. Uh, language is not a requirement for high school graduation in Rule 10. 
However, that does not mean that a local district cannot, a local district could require a language course um, as part of their own local high school graduation requirements. But from the state perspective, it's included as an offering in our K-12 instructional um, program requirements. The board was provided a set of materials, and if you look inside that set of materials, you'll see a page that says Language Learning in Nebraska. It's in Spark, I'll mention. It's the, the handout that's in there. This provides for you the current statistics as far as how many students are taking each particular language. This information was compiled using the annual survey that is sent to districts and returned with information regarding specific courses that students are taking how many students are taking that course, and what teacher and what endorsement that teacher has that are teaching that course. And you can see these are actual numbers. So seven represents the number of ASL students in Nebraska during the 2017-2018 school year. You'll notice too that in that same group of materials, the very final page is a glossary of terms. This provides some information regarding the kinds of world language programming that are available. There are programs that are FLEX or FLESS, that refers to elementary level world language programming. We also have middle school programming, which is typically exploratory. The goal of such programming is not proficiency, but rather to introduce students to a language. And then at the high school level, we have what is considered the traditional language study, generally where students are meant to acquire proficiency in the language for a dedicated purpose. The other piece uh, we wanted to, to acknowledge were the post-secondary requirements around world languages or um, foreign language as the university references. Um, there is not a consistent uh, requirement across our post-secondary systems. Um, for example, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln for admissions requires 16 units of academic courses. They require four English, four math, three social sciences, three natural sciences, and two world languages. But there's a little asterisk beside the requirement for world languages, and it says some programs require four years. And that's just with it UNL. So again, as we're thinking about um, the number of courses, the opportunity for students to learn, teachers to actually facilitate learning and instruction in those areas um, so they can proceed into post-secondary education because there may be a requirement. All of these things are, are um, related, yet also at the post-secondary um, inconsistencies uh, around the requirements even within a system. But I did want to reference that there are post-secondary requirements for language courses um, in our post-secondary system. One particular format of world language instruction is dual language programming. This does occur in Nebraska, and again, in the packet of supplementary materials, there is a paper that will explain to you more about dual language instruction in the state of Nebraska. You'll notice that there are five areas within Nebraska that offer dual language programming, and you'll notice the schools are listed specifically so you can see the age level. If you would like to see the number of students enrolled at each program, it's on the other side of that page in the bottom corner of languages taught in Nebraska. Okay, looking at the Seal of Biliteracy. The Seal of Biliteracy is an initiative that started in 2010 in California, essentially to promote the idea that languages make students career ready. So this is something that is now offered in the state of Nebraska. It has been done through the Nebraska International Language Association. Students can apply for the Seal of Biliteracy after they have shown that they achieved a certain level of proficiency through certain testing. It's their option to determine which test they would like to take. And then submitting those materials in their application to NILA, which then grants the seal. So all of that hopefully sets just a little bit of context around the revision um, of Nebraska's world language standards, which ultimately you will be approving um, tentatively in September. Um, as we think about um, those standards, and this information was shared with the committee last month, um, but in 2018 there was an advisory, a small group of uh, uh, an advisory committee that Stephanie pulled together to really clarify what is our vision for world language instruction and, and setting the framework for standards. And so thinking about the development of standards that 
prepare students for college careers and civic life, um, that promote effective and culturally appropriate communication in multiple contexts. We think about the importance of connecting language to and across other disciplines in authentic <laughs> context. I think that word authentic is really important because um, there's a big difference between a relevant context and an authentic context. Um, but also allowing students to experience learning through reflection and continuing to take into to consideration this idea of a growth mindset. So helping students see that they can learn a language, um, that um, everyone uh, has that ability, it takes practice and it takes time, but really facilitating that mindset of the students. So as we set the framework for what we hope our standards do, these would be some guiding principles relative to those standards. It's important to remember that the world language standards are going to be applicable to all languages and all levels because both of those are district level decisions. The five standards recognize and value our 1997 standards while requiring an advanced level of integrated language skills. You'll see an example of what those standards are going to look like. The increased specificity and focus across levels of proficiency will provide needed descriptors for classroom teachers. And I think this is what's really exciting as we think about this set of standards that will look somewhat different than other sets of standards that become more grade level standards. Um, the, the goal is to think about a proficiency level and uh, how we can help students advance across be, starting off as a novice, clear through um, advanced proficiency. And this chart, I think, highlights um, if we want students to be um, advance, to reach an advanced proficiency level, that language learning can't just occur at the high school level. Um, it can't just occur in grades, uh, uh, starting in grade seven, um, clear through 12. So this chart really um, highlights the importance of looking at language proficiency across um, grade levels. And I think it's an important consideration for schools to ultimately identify what level of proficiency do they hope students leave with um, from their programs. And if um, their goal is that intermediate range, then programs 9 through 12 um, are appropriate. But if they want students to reach an advanced level of proficiency based on their community, based on their parent needs, and based on their students, then they need to look at something more than high school-based language courses. Um, that being said, that idea of proficiency, I'm, I'm giving just kind of a, a preview of the work that Stephanie has led with the writers, is the standards um, focus on proficiency. And so this is an example of what uh, you'll see once the draft is available, is that we do have strands like other content areas. Um, and then you see the standard, which in this example says 1.1. Um, but then what's different about this is that the indicators are organized by proficiency level. So starting from novice low um, to advanced high. And this is, I think, what's unique about the content area, but also what I feel like is exciting about this revision um, is that it really focuses the conversation around proficiency levels um, and it's applicable across, across all languages. So um, whether you're teaching Chinese or whether you're teaching Spanish, this would be um, a set of standards that would really focus on the proficiency piece with that. So as the draft comes out, again, it'll look a little bit different from grade level specific standards because the focus is on proficiency um, and being applicable to all languages. Um, as far as the timeline, um, you know, the we're continuing to refine and edit throughout the spring. Um, this process started, um, like I mentioned, with the <coughs> Stephanie's advisory committee last summer. We'll work to engage um, the public and employers throughout the spring final tweaking and uh, editing is needed this summer and our hope would be that we'll have a draft um, for you to review in August with um, a vote anticipated in September. Um, again, Stephanie's been doing a great job in terms of really thinking about the implementation timeline because that's part of our staff's uh, task as well, not just get the standards done, but how do we provide support for implementation in schools. And so that'll be part of the information that we'll be able to share with you um, as we approach the summer. And if folks have infer or need more information, they're certainly welcome to, to reach out to us as needed. This graph is outstanding. And as I studied it further since our committee meeting this morning, and it was one of the questions we were asking, as I looked down in that 
kind of orangey box, gray, be beige rather. Uh, total students, grades 7 through 12 in Nebraska, there's 156,808. But the total students, K through 12, is 361,605 out of all of the various languages you have. Now I'm certain that a couple of these are more common than others on the yes. languages, but I think that really speaks well of our districts to see that there is 200 plus thousand students that are below the grade level of seventh grade that are being immersed in some type of foreign la world language. And so thank you for putting this together. You're welcome. It just really says a lot. Thank you, Corey. I've heard out in the field in regards to, if you will, the issue of seven years for the revision of a standard, and it, a lot are asking for a little bit longer time. Is that being considered? The seven-year cycle is in statute um, relative to ELA, math, science, and social studies, and the other areas um, we've put around that. It used to be five, um, and then we moved to seven. We are keeping CTE at a five-year cycle simply because we're trying to think about the nature of how those industries change. Some of those areas could yes. change annually. Mm -hmm. um, but I think seven does give districts um, an opportunity to implement. Um, and. Fingers crossed as we move forward with standards revision. We've had some pretty major changes um, over the last several years to college and career ready standards. Um, it would be great as we move forward to create consistency that it's more updating and refining, not major revisions. Thank so you. we're getting to a really good point, which would allow a district in that seven year to be really thoughtful around implementation and allow us to collect data on uh, the implementation in the district. Very good. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Lisa. with that today. Um, the second item is action item 3.4.B, which grants the commissioner the authority to contract with Education Measurement Consulting, LLC. And uh, Jeremy Henniger is going to provide us with a little information on this action item. Hello again. Hi. This one will be much shorter, I believe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this contract is with uh, Bill Audi, and he um, is going to help us with uh, federal peer review for ELPA 21 and for our math program. So uh, part of uh, uh, ESEA uh, requires that we submit um, basically confirmation of technical quality around our assessment. So our ELPA 21 is our, our, our um, uh, English language proficiency test. Um, and so that's due um, actually March 15th. Um, <laughs> so just around the corner. Um, luckily, that's part of a consortium. And so he's helping us with a lot of the logistics of getting that done. Um, previously, Bill did, did, was our psychometric consultant. Now that we have our psychometrician in house, we no longer need his services for that. But he's still uh, a, a prime player in the peer review world um, because he's a peer reviewer himself. And so he's just helping us make sure that we're uh, crossing all those T's and dotting all those I's um, as we work through uh, the peer review process uh, for both math, for NSCAS math and alternate math. Um, and that's due uh, down the road, but also that ELPA 21 that's due here in a week. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you for the shortened version. That's yeah, really not nice. A problem. Any questions from the team? All right, seeing no questions, we are finished with all of this. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, Lisa. We'll now turn, if you will, Patricia Tim, please report on the policy committee meeting, please. The policy committee has one consent agenda item. Uh, this is to reaffirm by board bylaw B1, board officers. This bylaw describes the duties of the board president and vice president. The policy committee completed their four-year review and recommended a non-substantive revision and will recommend that the full board reaffirm this bylaw uh, tomorrow as a consent agenda item. Uh, the policy committee has five discussion items, the first being board position statement, S1, non-discrimination and equal opportunity in schools. This is set to expire um, actually yesterday, uh, the 3rd of, of March, or, or the 6th of March. 
This position statement has been under discussion for some time. The current proposal incorporates the board's resolution previously, previously adopted about this topic to the existing language of S1, that being the resolution that we did on equity. In February, the committee agreed on further revisions in regard to supporting the board's legislative priorities. And the policy committee is recommending that this uh, policy or this position statement uh, be reviewed by um, success and access because of all of the work that they are doing at the present time uh, regarding equity and uh, respect and dignity of uh, all of the people who um, are a part of our system. And uh, we're asking them to review and bring back uh, their recommendations uh, to us in April, and then we will report again. And um, we also have the board position statement S3, <coughs> reading and writing. The policy committee recommends that this position statement as written sunset and recommend that the teaching and learning committee review and make recommendations on rewriting this position statement to align with our current NDE measures involving literacy. Uh, we have a four-year review of state bylaw uh, B4, which is task forces and advisory committees. Uh, the policy committee discussed this, and uh, this will be recommended to be reaffirmed. We didn't have any uh, revisions as yet, and this will be recommended to reaffirm uh, by the full board in April. We have a four-year review of state board bylaw B17 public statements by board members. The policy committee discussed, and if no um, revisions are proposed by April, the committee will recommend that again we reaffirm this in April. And our last item was a uh, review of state bylaw, state board bylaw B19, computer equipment, internet access, and electronic <coughs> mail. We've discussed the contents of this bylaw, which was approved in 2018. Uh, we were just reviewing because we've had some suggestions about um, our, um, the way we access things. And uh, we will proceed to review this bylaw for its scheduled four re four year, at its four year review in 2022. So this was just a discussion that, because we just put this one together. And um, next, um, we will start a four year review in April on B13 rule development um, and uh, state board policy P2, which is line and staff relations. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you very much, ma'am. <coughs> Vice President Nichols, please report on the legislative committee meeting, please. Thank you. Um, the State Board Legislative Committee met earlier today and we had some lively discussions on things that Brian led us through and just so you know what he'll be referencing, there is a document in Spark under our committee for those of you that are not on the committee to be able to review. And so Brian, I'm going to let you take over to share the important pieces that we need to share. Good afternoon, uh, Brian Holstead, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, if you recall, a month ago on this date, the board took up legislation that adopted positions on bills before the legislature this session. Uh, in that meeting, I pointed out how this year's legislature is unique for the calendar because it started on the last date possible in January under the Constitution and how it will adjourn sine die on the 75th anniversary of D-Day in June. Uh, today was day 38 for the legislature, and I know everybody this morning was wondering when will spring come in Nebraska? That will come when the legislature completes its 45th <laughs> legislative day on March 20th. So hump day is in the future for the legislative calendar in that regard. In Spark, you have the two-page document that attaches the boards that you, uh, the bills the board took positions on, and where those bills were as of close of business on Tuesday. I would note, guess what? Some of those have changed hmm. just a little bit. Um, in the fact that LB 160 
is on final reading now. It says select file. That's because it moved on Wednesday morning. Uh, we did not, the governor did not report to the legislature before it adjourned today whether he signed LB 115 and LB 122. We may not know until next Tuesday because the legislature isn't back mm. in then as to whether the governor signed those. If he doesn't sign them, they become law, but he has generally taken all five days that's permitted before he reports back to the legislature. Um, there are a number of bills that are going to be having hearings coming up in March. Uh, the commissioner kind of briefed both the Budget and Finance Committee and the Legislative mm -hmm. Committee that we have our hearing before the Appropriations Committee on Tuesday, March 19th. Uh, several of the bills that you took position supporting that are actually funding issues for the Department of Health and Human Services. We anticipate those will have hearings on Tuesday, March 27th, so we will be signaling our support for those bills in that regard. Um, and this morning, LB 399, that's now on select file. The legislature spent about an hour this morning on select file debate and Senator Chambers and some other senators made it known they intend to make the legislature take all the time it's required on select file before that bill may advance to final reading. There's some cleanup amendments that have been posted, so we're going to be monitoring that as we go forward. But um, at the moment, uh, that's largely where the legislature is and where we are. Uh, la on February 7th, you had a discussion about a bill that you decided not to take a position on, and I think uh, I'll turn it back over to the chair of the committee of what the committee has discussed and found out since that time on LB 241. So, um, Yes, we did have um, some enlightening conversations since February 7th regarding Senator Bowles. Thank you. I'm getting worse than Lisa now. Um, we did have a lively discussion on Senator Bowles' LB241, the mentoring bill. We've done a lot of discussion on it in our weekly legislative calls regarding it and whatnot, and again today in committee. And the committee tomorrow will recommend that the State Board of Education support LB241 with an amendment that provides that funding for the 2020-21 <coughs> school year be, uh, be available for NDE to plan for implementation of teacher mentoring programs that in the 2021-2022 school year, school districts can apply to NDE for funding to carry out teacher mentoring in school districts. That ends my report. Any questions? Thank you, Vice, thank you, Vice President Nichols. Thank you very much, ma'am. Next, Patricia Tim, please report on the Commissioner's Appraisal Committee meeting. Uh, we have not met. We will meet tomorrow morning. 8 o'clock, is that correct? Yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Patsy Coe Johns, please report on the AQUEST Student Success and Access Domain Committee meeting. Uh, the Student Success and Access Domain Committee met with one discussion item and five action items. And the discussion item um, we're bringing back, we've discussed it before, um, and so we're bringing new information to you about the equity lens that we've discussed over um, the last couple of months. So um, we have some internal and external feedback that's come back to us. I kind of want you to know about that. Um, our board members, several of them, have uh, brought back information to us about responses to the equity lens as they had discussions with administrators and other people across the state. Um, and uh, individual board members gave me reactions to um, the rough draft of a equity lens that we shared with them last month. Um, we were advised by you and by, uh, I was advised by my committee that we should see that, seek out opinions from other educational groups such as the Administrators Association, um, School Board Association, Stance, NSCA, NSAA, 
NERCSA. Um, we also wanted to reference, um, before we began putting together our own equity lens, the commissioner's, um, a couple of his speeches. Um, his speech that he did when he announced that um, this is the year of, uh, that we champion equity and one that he gave at the state capitol with a group of other leaders from some of these organizations. Because we'd like to see the language alive, okay, so that we're not just pulling language from other places. If it's really going to be Nebraska, we want to take some of your language and, and use it. And then, as I understand it, the policy uh, committee, committee is putting together also a, a, a kind of a companion policy that it seems uh, apropos and maybe, you know, like one of those uh, happy accidents that they're side by side. And so um, we would also like to study what they've been doing and take a look at what they're doing. And uh, John came to me with that, and I also have some of that there. So we'll be looking at that. Um, as I was trying to contact some of these people, I realized that some of these people might be busy in the legislature. And so um, I was having some difficulty getting a hold of them or getting callbacks. And so um, I sat down about 1 o'clock in the morning and slammed out a letter to them. And I gave that to my committee. Um, those of you who have been uh, had your grammar, your punctuation corrected by me, I humbled myself and said, uh, please, please take a look at this. And uh, I am fully aware that it's not up to standards. Please add your ideas, corrections, et cetera. So they'll be sending those back to me in the next uh, few days so that I can then do, send those out to those organizations and leaders that you've recommended that we, that we um, talk to about this equity lens. Uh, I think one of the most important things that came out of this meeting to me is um, this is really, really important. And uh, it's not only important for the school board, I think we'll begin the journey and maybe the journey will end across the whole state. And so no rushes, no hurry mates. We want to do it, we want to do it right so that it lasts a very, very long time. And I used myself as an example. I'd be the first to admit that I made equity mistakes as a teacher and I look back at them and think, how did I not know that? And had I had a lens to look through and ask myself some very pertinent questions. Perhaps I wouldn't have made those mistakes that may have affected the lives of, of students across the state. So we're going to go slowly and we're going to keep reporting to you until we get it just right. Any questions about that? Okay, uh, moving along to our action items. Um, Point three or 3.5B action item to grant the commissioner the authority to amend the existing contract and lease with ESU 14, the Nebraska Center for the Education of Children who are Blind or Visually Impaired. Um, the committee received information from staff members concerning this amendment uh, uh, to funding for the Nebraska Center for the Education of Children who are uh, Blind or Visually Impaired. And the committee recommends that we approve this item tomorrow. Um, I'll take any questions or ideas. Okay. 3.5C, action item, grant the commissioner the authority to approve two contracts with Easter Seals, Nebraska. Um, Easter Seals will continue, will conduct the Nebraska Empowerment Youth Camp and the inspiring change make makers leadership training programs. Um, the item to grant authority for two contracts to one entity um, that will total over $50,000 and that's why it was brought to us. And um, the committee recommends that uh, we approve this item as well, this action item tomorrow. Questions? Um, 3.5D, action item, grant the commissioner the authority to approve the two contracts with Educational Service 
Unit 16, ESU 16, for the Summer Internship Program, Summer Work Education and Employment Program, um, SWEEP is the acronym for it. Um, this item is also funding for pre-employment transition services and activities. Again, the two contracts um, to one entity that will total over 50,000 um, has to be brought forward to us. Uh, similar to the pre previous item because it is more than that $50,000. Um, the committee recommends that we approve this item and um, also uh, ask if you have any questions about that. Uh, the next item um, is um, 3.5E and it's an action item that grants the commissioner authority to approve um, cooperative agreement for um, NEMTSS, regional facilitators with ESU3, um, ESU10, and ESU13. Uh, the commissioner had a discussion with the staff regarding uh, the state MTSS supports as it relates to this item for cooperative agreements with educational service units. Uh, the committee has asked staff to share more infor information on MTSS with us and the connection to these contacts. So, Amy Rome will come forth. It's me, and I calm down. <laughs> so, um, this cooperative agreement, um, there's three cooperative agreements actually, um, one with ESU 3, ESU 10, and ESU 13. Our plan is to split the state into three and provide regional support around MTSS. Currently we do that through an implementation support team that has people from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, a federal technical assistance center, and um, NDE consultants that um, comprise themselves of the implementation support team. Um, we're we're looking to branch out and provide even additional supports around training, facilitation, um, data analysis, and components to help support the ESUs and districts in those three regions um, with the intent to even expand more as we move into um, MTSS even further and hopefully um, in the next year provide five su regional support people. Um, but for now we're starting with three and we'll see how that goes. So that is the intent of this cooperative agreement which is kind of like a grant, um, but we call it something different because of federal regulations. And I'm going to steal your quote because I loved it, and it certainly fits in with everything I believe. <coughs> Amy, you said that MTSS means equity and education for all students. And I did I say think, that. Yes, she did yeah. say that. <laughs> so I'm very smart. You are a very <laughs> smart person. And I know that because I was your teacher, so I know that. Okay, so um, the committee recommends that we approve this item. And are there any questions for Amy? Thank you okay. very much. 3.5F action item, grant the commissioner the authority to amend the current 2018-19 contracts for the four regional programs for deafness and hard of hearing. The board previously approved these contracts. The committee received information regarding the amended amounts and recommends that the uh, board approve this item tomorrow. Are there any questions? All right. This concludes the Student Success and Access Committee report. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you very much, ma'am. I will report on the Budget and Finance Committee meeting. Could I have uh, Bryce Wilson and Shane Rhyme please come on up? Our first is a discussion. Item is the information on Legislature Appropriations Committee hearing on the Department of Education's bi biennial budget request. Could we have a brief? And I'll, I'll share just okay. briefly. I mean, actually, Brian hit on a few of those points. I did try to talk to the Legislative Committee a, again today about March 19th being the the uh, uh, hearing date, and also talked to the Finance Committee kind of about some of the details of our budget. Obviously, the budget we submitted last. Last uh, September is the budget that's still in front of the, the legislature at this moment in time. Obviously, as the landscape continues to 
be shaped around the legislative session. We wouldn't anticipate that we get every everything. I think a couple items that appear, kind of equity lens perspectives. I know that um, there's interest in uh, increasing the funding um, possibly for um, the contract around the um, uh, Center for the Blind and Visually, or Center for the Education of the Blind and Visually Impaired, that's actually ESU4, will we'll come in and present at, at our hearing around that front. Certainly the notion around uh, coordinated school health is a, is a topic I expect others to come testify in, in support of around our budget. There's several other things that we feel are important there that I wouldn't necessarily expect we'll get all of it, but I want to give you a little update and hopefully you can watch on March 19th at least by by video um, and, and again it's we're trying to lead in a lot of different ways I might just highlight one more thing because I know I've talked to the legislative committee I've submitted a couple letters of support mm. for uh, the uh, um, so the uh, Nebraska Indian Affairs Commission um, for instance for generally just supporting their activity we're hoping to be able to do a bit of a summit work kind of build hopefully this summer but I, I believe Judy Goshkabash is going to ask ask about um, additional funding for that and I wanted to indicate our general support for their their partnership and their work and then also uh, did something similar for the Latino American Commission um, submitting uh, a, a letter of support they have picked up a lot of the leadership around uh, the Hispanic Latino Student Summit um, and really took the leadership on that we um, we didn't lose funding we had federal funds that were changed that could no longer be used to support that and so I want to indicate our support for their efforts on that so there's a lot of different things happening in the appropriations world but that's essentially what we talked about mm -hmm. they'll give you um, context of our audit but there's a lot of context happening around school finance and other things too as, as we go forward thank you Commissioner to pay attention thank you very much sir Bryce you want to start us off with the audit sure so um, the, you're going to have an action item tomorrow to accept the uh, 2018 CAFR audit, which is the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report audit. Uh, basically, it's the audit the state auditors go through, the whole entire state, all the agencies um, get audited, and they roll that all together to create the state's financial um, reports. We have, it's an annual audit that we go through, so we have this fun every year. Um, we had three findings that were noted on the report, all of which um, I would consider to be pretty minor findings. No, there were no misappropriation of assets, no kinds of um, issues around money being used incorrectly or anything like that. There are process items where um, the first one was primarily just financial, for the financial report, information was reported in the incorrect year. So out of the 330 million of federal report, um, federal funds reported, there's about four and a half million that were um, recorded in the incorrect years, basically what that finding is saying all of which we were aware of and let DAS know or Department of Administrative Services know that that needed to be moved over. It's just that the accounting system that we have did not allow us to make those corrections. So we had to, it had to become a manual correction, which was all done. So there was nothing that actually was um, in the end done incorrectly. It just had to be fixed um, because there was a mistake on the front end. And then the other two findings were around uh, technology issues. One was um, access was allowed to a couple of different programs, the GMS system and the CNP system, which is the child nutrition program system um, for users that had terminated or shouldn't have had access anymore. Um, nobody did access anything. So again, nothing, no, but no information was accessed or no changes were made that shouldn't have been done. Um, additionally, there they wouldn't have actually have been able to send state money out because um, they didn't have access to the accounting system. So they could have got into some, a couple of systems potentially, um, but we've addressed those, those issues. Um, we've created new control forms where access is granted and, sign and, and terminated um, with supervisor approval to address that and make sure that doesn't happen again. And then the last one was um, <clears throat> just that we needed to develop an information technology risk assessment plan um, that has been under, um, it's been in, in work for a while now. Um, we're getting very, very close to the end product. Our uh, project management team has been leading that work and um, should have some, we'll have it, we've said in our um, response to that finding, we'll have it done by June 30th, but I think likely we'll done, be done with that um, before that time and, and start implementing that plan to make sure that all of our all of our technology systems are reviewed and made sure that we don't have any holes where things can happen that we don't want to happen so thank you bryce and did you also want to introduce uh 
yes. Shane's replacement? Yes, so as you're aware, Shane, Shane's leaving us, and Jen Udemark, who has been our state aid director and <coughs> done just an absolutely wonderful job there, um, leading that part of our finance team over there, is going to step into Shane's role as the administrator for financial services. So um, you'll get to know her, and the budget work as well. So you will get to know Jen as well. She'll be up in front of you guys a little bit more, but she will do a fantastic job as she does on everything. So look forward to it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Wise, please report on the strategic planning, performance, and improvement committee meeting. Uh, I'm only going to take about 30 minutes to report it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there is conversation. In, your, uh, in Spark, you have two documents. I'm going to talk briefly about the first one, and that is for action item for tomorrow during our business meeting, and it is a street strategic planning recommendations. It's a one-page document with uh, five uh, general recommendations and action steps relating to those recommendations, um, and that will be... It was supported by the committee and it will be in front of you tomorrow for adoption. And thank you everybody who put input into that over the last month. It has been revised a little bit since you saw it last month. The next document that you have is a draft working document that is an implementation plan. This document will not be adopted. Uh, this is for your information to help see kind of the strategies, timelines and responsibilities for the implementation of the recommendations and action steps. So the one page recommendations will be up for uh, adoption and action tomorrow. The other document is an implementation plan and this is just a working guide for you to get a sense of the work and the time frame for the work going forward for the implementation of the strategic planning recommendations. Are there any questions? Oh, then it won't take 30 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. We'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wise. We'll move on to reports, dates, and discussion <laughs> items. Uh, do you have anything under this? I see nothing from the commissioner. Okay. Thank you for submitting your monthly report. Board members' reports are linked in Spark, and I encourage you to review. Did you get something? I'm sorry. No, no, no. I just have my monthly reports right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll continue on. Board member reports are linked in Spark, and I encourage you to review each member's reports, and you're highly encouraged to go ahead and email your, your Word documents to Ryan for uh, just prior to the meeting, and he'll attach them in Spark accordingly. Also, in regards to quarterly discussion on our meeting participation, we have rescheduled that for tomorrow afternoon during our business meeting. Tomorrow after, not afternoon. But you know, oh, uh, we hope. Morning. But given now in the day, when you never know. <laughs> we were going. It could be afternoon. <laughs> but what the heck? So we had it been postponed. Members will uh, share briefly about one event or activity they participated participated in within the last three months. Uh, tomorrow we will vote on a request to approve attendance at meetings that took place in the past and were not previously approved. There are six meeting approval requests as listed on our agenda. Also, the request for future meeting attendance, travel from board members are linked in the SPARC meetings. Tomorrow we approve the board request for meeting attendance. Uh, also, monthly board travel expense report is attached in the SPARC meetings for your review. And lastly, the regularly scheduled meeting of the State Board of Education will convene tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in this room. Thank you very much. We are we are adjourned. Two minutes till five.